That's the one thing about our audience. They always want a new guy to break through the glass ceiling. And all you have to do is just be real. Allow me to reintroduce myself. I am the jabroni beating, pie eating, trail blazing, eyebrow raising, talking is done, you're out of your class, no sleep till Brooklyn, the rock whoops your ass. Woo! I wish you and King would quit talking. All right, welcome to Around the Ring, episode 73. It is Sunday, November 27th, 2016. Uh, my name is Dave Brown. I'm one half of your hosts. I'm joined with, as always, by my co-host, Floyd Johnson. How you doing, sir? I am doing well. I just, I'm just i still full from Thanksgiving. I'm still full as far as a wrestling fan from that great Survivor Series pay-per-view we had. So I am ready to talk some wrestling today. Definitely, I was. Uh, I, I'm still pretty full as well. Did you? Speaking of, for those not in the United States, we just celebrated Thanksgiving, one of our big, big holidays, one of the big four, so to speak. And uh, did you have a good one? I did. Uh, I did have to work, but uh, I ordered a food from a restaurant called Cracker Barrel, and my sister made a couple of my favorite sides, so I was able to have a good meal. And then my friend Colton brought me. Uh, some food while I was at work, so I was able to eat pretty good and still got still got a little Black Friday shopping done at the end of the night. Well, good. Very good. Yeah, I went to uh, the grandparents' house, my my wife's folks' house. We went and had uh, had a um, early dinner, I guess lunch, blupper, whatever. We gorged ourselves around, you know, two. And uh, then went to see my brother, and, and God bless him. And uh, both a bunch of us were. My brother smokes, and everyone in his family it, it smokes that lives with him. And so we are all still um, trying to recuperate from being in a smoky house for forty-five minutes. No. Uh, because man, because if you're not used to being around smoke, that stuff will mess with you bad, and it will, and it lingers. And people don't realize. I think smokers especially don't realize how much this the smoke itself can affect other folks but uh but yeah so this it is thanksgiving that time of the year which means it is survivor series time of the year which happened last sunday now interestingly the history of survivor series essentially if i and correct me if i'm wrong with my history but survivor series was basically vince man's vince mcmahon's middle finger to jim crockett um and trying to combat starcade because starcade always happened right around Thanksgiving every year. Okay. I did not know that. I honestly didn't. I just thought um, the WWE, uh, in their wisdom, because this is me just thinking backwards, uh, you got two Thanksgiving games, and then Thursday night there was this big hole with nothing to do. You know, you didn't have the third uh, football game. You didn't have uh, Black Friday wasn't a big thing right then. So it was just like you actually had this Thursday evening with uh, any nothing to do. So Survivor Series was actually on Thanksgiving Day uh, for the first few of them. And it was just like he saw as a show that families could go out to after football. Because Vince has always followed football. That's a big thing with him. True. True, but no, it was uh, Thanksgiving was the time of year where the NWA always had their supercard, Starcade. And by the time WWE did Survivor Series, and, and everyone realized Survivor Series was WWE's second pay per view. Uh, mm -hmm. The first was WrestleMania, and then a few years later came Survivor Series. And at the time, not only did they run Survivor Series, in direct competition to Starcade, they also threatened cable companies that if you carry Starcade, you can't next year carry WrestleMania. Uh, wow! Yeah, and now now how um, how NWA and Jim Crockett promotion specifically uh, was able to get back at them. Uh, the following year was when uh, Clash of Champions first appeared. And it occurred on the same night as WrestleMania 4. And needless to say, WrestleMania 4's buy rates weren't as good as WrestleMania 3. 
Granted, WrestleMania 4's card didn't have anywhere near the build-up that WrestleMania 3 did. Uh, but it, it four, was... 4 was the battle, I mean, uh, the tournament for the world title. Right. But, I mean, you, you're not, you didn't have this Hulk Hogan-Andre the Giant match, which was yeah. such a huge deal. You didn't have the Ricky Steamboat-Randy Savage match, which goes down as one of the greatest matches in history. Uh, but yeah, but because by that point, Hogan's not the main guy, and so it doesn't have, even though there's this big tournament, there's not the star power on WrestleMania 4. So what happens as a wrestling fan, you're, you're, you had this choice on that Sunday. You could either drop however much money it was, 30, some 40, 50 bucks, whatever it was, to watch the WWE pay-per-view, or you could for free turn to Superstation WTBS and and watch Clash of Champions with a 45-minute-long Ric Flair-Sting match that also goes down in the annals of history as one of the greatest matches of all time. Because it ended in a time limit draw, and that's really what put Sting on the map. It is. That that one match is really what put him over and made him a superstar. So that is, for those of you who did not know, a little history into Survivor Series. And, uh, I, you know, I mean, Vince did win in the end, but, uh, I, and I more surprisingly st- history that I did not know. Yeah, there you go. There you go. I still think it would have been cool for, for them when they, they bought out WCW to keep the Starcade name around. I mean, they did clash or not bash of the beach for a while or the great American bash, some variation of that they had for a bit. Uh, but really they need to get, get rid of hell in a cell and do Halloween havoc or if they're insistent on Hell in a Cell, if you're going to have two pay-per-views in October, one can be Hell in a Cell, the other one could be Halloween Havoc. And that would be right. You could even bring in War Games to it. Oh, but no. No, as I was going to say, War Games was my favorite back in the day, and but I would never want them to do it because it would be this PG cleaned up nightmare that I wouldn't want to see. Um and I'll complain about it, even though I know that's the world we live in now. There you go. All right. Well, let's talk about Survivor Series. It happened last Sunday. Did you watch the pre-show? I I generally pick up extra time on Sundays, so more than likely, I'm not going to watch the pre-show unless it's for a title or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I didn't either. So, uh, But for those curious who don't already know... T.J. Perkins, Rich Swan, and Noam Dar beat Drew Gulag, Tony Nese, and Arya Davari. I'm sure it was a fun match. I may go back and watch it. And in one of the more head-scratching moments of the evening, Kane defeated Luke Harper. Yes. So we'll forget about that and yeah. uh, move on to the show. The show opened up with the women. Uh, Team Raw, which was Charlotte, Sasha Banks, Bailey, Alicia Fox, and Nia Jax, with Dana Brooke in their corner, taking on Team SmackDown of Natalia stepping in for the air quote injured Nikki Bella, Carmella, Alexa Bliss, Naomi, and Becky Lynch. Now, do you think this had to do with the fact that her tooth got messed up the week before on SmackDown? Um, or or do you just think this is building to a Natalia uh, Nikki feud? Natalia Nikki feud, I believe it's in Canada, and Natalia not being on the team would have maybe caused the match to get hijacked. Her True. being a manager. Uh, I mean, Toronto was definitely live, but when they didn't like something, they let you know, and I think that wouldn't have that would have been a problem. Uh, Nikki um, and Natalia not actually being in the match. Um, and then, like I said, the next feud, it'll set up the next feud for Nikki with Natalia beating, yeah, and then Nikki starting their feud. And that, that'll be a decent enough feud. I mean, I'm, I'm sure those two work well together. Um, I mean, we'll see. Uh, this match, uh, you know, the, so, okay, so first of all, that crowd was fantastic. Another just great crowd, uh. And I, before I forget, I will have to say, I think, because we're going to talk about the most over, but before I forget, the most over thing, the entire Survivor Series weekend, Ty Dillinger's 10. Yes. And instead of counting one, two, three, they would just say 10, 10, 10. They did it on the And, and it was the fact that they had it down fairly quickly. 
because the referee would be counting out people and they would go 10. And it confused me because I didn't know what number he was on a lot of times. I know. And I know that probably had to confuse the wrestlers. Oh, yeah, because you know they, they were, weren't going to be able to hear the poor refs over that deafening crowd. Yeah. Um, but this overall was actually a, a pretty good match. I thought Nia Jax looked great. Uh, this was one of her best performances. Um, the big takeaway was uh, Charlotte and Bailey ended up being the sole survivors. And I did see when Bailey pinned Necky, or Necky, I'm getting my words mixed up, Becky Lynch, the crowd seemed a little pissed. Uh, I think yes, the, I think the, the crowd Becky's, wanted Becky. If it's up to the WWE Universe, Becky never loses. Yes, I agree. And it would it would have been really cool to see her just come back and beat the two of them. Well, you know, you're always going to set up a feud. A problem I had during this match, I did not like I did not like the Nijax tap to the disarmor. I uh, I would have liked her to get eliminated similar to some, how someone else got eliminated earlier and uh, later in the show. I'd rather have been a DQ, a count out, keeping her look strong. But, yeah, the tap out in a weak-looking disarmor. I mean, she didn't even have it on good. And it was like, okay, um, you got your monster that you've been building up, and you tap her out fairly quickly. I know wins and losses in the minds of WWE doesn't matter, but I didn't like that. My my thing with that, the only part of that that bothered me was that it was such a bad-looking disarmor. Because you think about the the physics of the disarmor, it doesn't matter how strong and how powerful you are or how big you are. If that move gets locked on and your joint locks and starts going in the wrong direction, I don't care who you are, man. You are going to scream, let me out of this, please. You're about to break my arm. And she was in a, and she was, you know, the disarmor is put on in a unique position where she's looking away and pulling back. So really, there's not too much you can do as far as the reverse. So I, I do get it, and I like the move, but it was just like, you know what, you've been doing all this stuff to make Nia look, Jax look unstoppable, and then you have her tap out in the middle of this. And a lot of people have, have actually voiced that same complaint. I guess it just it didn't bother me because I see certain things like maybe because I see even though Nia Jax is this monster and they did a really good job in this match building her up as this unstoppable beast. I just see Becky Lynch at this whole other level. I mean, realistically, you know, you would think Ronda Rousey comes in and is going to have a match with someone in the first person that, that in my mind, I think who could legitimately have a, a, a wrestling match with Ronda Rousey and could look like she could you know win, the first person I think of is Becky Lynch. Because Becky is that good. Um, and she also looks like, I mean, she's strong. She's She's got those you know biceps and she's all built and stuff and looks like she'll just mess you up. And, and uh, so, yeah, that I don't think it's going to hurt Nia Jax as much as a lot of people think it will. Uh, because, like you said, wins and losses get forgetting, forgotten really quickly. And all she's going to have to do is, on Raw, just destroy a few people. And, theoretically, she and Becky Lynch aren't going to see each other again until the Royal Rumble or Mania. So That's it's, true. Uh, um, and, uh, the, of course, the Charlotte turn on Bailey, which wasn't really a turn, but yeah, Charlotte. Charlotte being Charlotte. Yeah. And she is so good as a heel. She is so much better as a heel, even though from everything I can tell, she is in real life. She seems to be a sweet person, but man, she is so good at just that bitchy heel. And, we'll say, uh, I mean, she, I can't, I'm not going to say that like, everything comes from her dad, but learning how to be a heel. I mean, all that road time with her dad, as far as when they're performing together and him giving, dropping hints and telling her, do this and that. I mean, from one of the greatest heels ever, come on. I mean, because sure. her character is a female version of what Ric Flair is. I am better than all of you. And it was, and it is perfect. And she catches the tone. And I mean, it's like, it's like the perfect continuation of your favorite movie. You're right. You're right. Uh, so next up, we had The Miz with Maurice. 
defending the Intercontinental Championship against Sami Zayn. Uh, now, one thing that the first thing I noticed about this was the change of the announce team. Uh, so, and I was wondering how they were going to do it because at first, when Morrow was out there, I thought, "Oh, great! Well, Morrow's just going to lead the whole thing." And then, no, it was Michael Cole. I was like, "Ah, oh, crap!" But it made sense. They've got, if you include Tom Phillips, they've got what seven announcers. So they're yeah. Gonna... I don't get the whole Tom Phillips thing. I don't know. What, are they building to him eventually taking over for Morrow as Morrow goes to two hundred five live, or? I don't get it because it just seems cluttered. It does. That desk is too small for four people unless they build a bigger desk and that will just look silly. And does uh, Tom talk during matches? I don't even notice him during matches. He occasionally does, but I think it was on this week's SmackDown. People just got lost at some point. If, if I remember correctly, someone was like, hey, David, what do you think? Essentially, in, in not so many words, you know, in phrasing a different way, but Otunga just wasn't saying anything. And one of them was like, hey, hey, what are your thoughts? Uh, so it, it gets really jumbled. So I guess on these on these split on these joint pay-per-views, it makes sense to mix up the announced teams. And I actually did overall enjoy it because one, no one was really there long enough consistently to get really annoying. Mm-hmm. And two, it was nice hearing the different interplays with people. It was, you know, it was nice hearing Corey Graves giving, o, you know, Otunga some crap, um, and 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 the whole way. I, I just, I kind of actually enjoyed that. I thought that was a, a good, a good thing they did. I honestly, after like ten minutes, didn't notice. I didn't notice that because I was honestly when they went from Morrow to Cole, I was trying to drown it out because <laughs> I'm like, I mean, I mean, it's one of those things. It's like having the best steak ever, and then having a steak out of a garbage can right after. You know, yeah, yeah, that that is that's that's true. Well, uh, what'd you think of this match? Miz ended up retaining thanks to shenanigans from Maurice. All right, so I'm gonna take my personal uh, side out of it. Honestly, you got to keep the Miz and Daniel Bryan together because, I mean, their chemistry and their hate for each other, uh, whether real, written, or whatever, they do it so well. Their general disdain for each other. Um, I honestly didn't, I guess, bringing Sami Zayn to SmackDown would be cool because it would keep him away from Kevin Owens because it just seems like. No matter what, you're just kind of waiting for that feud to happen for the world title just because they're on the same show. You're like, when are they going to do Sammy and Kevin again? You know, so if you got them on SmackDown, it wouldn't even be a thought anymore. I The Miz right now is, I, I think he is every bit for SmackDown what Jericho is for Raw. He might not be as funny, but the, he's carrying that heel mantle. I mean, he's the Intercontinental Champion, and he's clearly the biggest heel on SmackDown. Oh, I could I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I've, I've for the longest time thought the Miz is to SmackDown what Chris Jericho is to Raw, and, and it's it's brilliant. And I, I'm a guy I've never liked the Miz until just recently when when that last run it started with that last run when he won the the uh, the title from uh, Zack Ryder and Maurice came back. Starting with that run, I was like. Okay, this guy actually has something, and then his whole interplay with Daniel Bryan is just fantastic. Um, what I would like to see is I would like to see Daniel Bryan pull Sami Zayn from um, from Raw and bring him over to SmackDown after The Miz finishes his feud with Ziggler, which we know is going to continue. Um, so Miz needs to, as much as I love Dolph, Miz needs to beat Dolph. Maybe Dolph goes on and has a short feud with uh, with with AJ Styles because you know those matches would be great. Even if we know who's going to win, it doesn't matter. They'll be fun to watch. Uh, yeah. And then Daniel Bryan could bring in Sami Zayn and say, "Okay, well you screwed this guy over. He's now my proxy." Um, and that would that would be a good rub for Sami to work with Daniel Bryan like that. Um, and crowds already love him. So it would... And, and the two of those, that was actually a really good match. They, I thought they had a pretty good chemistry together. They did. Uh, like I said, my big problem with Sami Zayn, I would like to see him develop more of a character. He is this... 
I mean, he is so straight, generic, lovable loser type guy. I lose a lot. Sometimes I win, though. I lose a lot. Sometimes I win. But it's kind of like I would like to see him develop more as a character. Uh, as on the indies, as you may have seen, as El Generico, he was more of a comic comedic character, especially with the promos and the outside of things, and it was funny. And but now as Sami Zayn, you have taken that comedy out of him, and he just seems like this kind of mopey emo guy that sometimes wins. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can definitely see that, and I, I think Sami Zayn, I think, is one of those guys you either get Sammy or you don't. Um, and and for those, I don't. exactly, and I do. So that that that's for, so for me, Sammy, I. I just love him. And some of that probably is because I look at like T-shirts he wears and, and people he follows on on Twitter. I'm like, okay, I like a lot of the same music Sammy likes, so I've got that kind of connection with him, um, so to speak. As much of a connection as you can have with someone you're watching on TV. God, that sounded stupid. <sighs> no, I know I get it because he is the everyman, and especially that plays more into it with you because he even listens to the same bands that you listen to, and and that's what he's supposed to be. He's the everyman type character, but like I said, it doesn't play well. It really, I mean, as a person just watching the show, he just seems like a guy that got. I mean, his biggest. The biggest thing you know about him is that his best friend turned on him, and they've really never played. He he's he's never come off like that broke his heart. That Kevin Owens did that to him. Not and on I the main they, roster, at least they. Yes, I, and I think that could have been played more. And honestly, like a, maybe a Mick Foley type sit down that. Hey man, he meant everything to me. We were came up. We were best friends. Even when he would tell the story, it just didn't come off like he believed it. Yeah, some of that, I, I wonder sometimes how much uh, on the main roster they they were like, okay, guys, we're going to have you feud, but we need you to hold it back because at some point down the line, we're going to have you feud for something bigger, and we really want it to come out and be big and special then. We don't want to do, do it all right now. We want to have something bigger down the line, so we're going to keep it, tone it back a few notches, don't go all in. Even though that that match they had it, I think it was Battleground was fantastic. Uh, I I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of it because in in NXT they did such a better job building it up. That I mean, that haven't been said. They do everything better in NXT, <laughs> uh, but it yeah, it's just something's not right. And here's maybe here's to hope in in a year or two uh, they will have a big WrestleMania match for a world title and at that point they will really delve into the history hopefully they can get some um some pictures from some of the indies of their early days together uh they can talk about how you know they could even go it if i was writing it i would have them go into that long and storied history about all the feuds all the times that you know kevin stabbed him in the back and he should have known better yet he can't help but but trust this guy because he wants because when he's when he's good he's so good and they're they've been through so much together and he just he wants to believe in him and uh and he just ends up falling for that every time and then and then you can bring up the whole until I got signed to WWE and then the jealousy took over and then his son bought a Sami Zayn t-shirt and that drove him crazy and uh you could you could really do a super compelling story which means they probably won't. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. It's just, Sammy's over. Don't get me wrong. Sammy's over. But I think he could take that, uh, even though, I, like I said, I wouldn't necessarily like it. Man, and this is, like I said, it's me trying to be somewhat unbiased. Uh, I think he could take that next step, and I think he could be on a John Cena-type level with a compelling storyline where he is... Uh, more, more and like I said, we more sold the storyline. Like he was broken hearted, he was depressed, he wasn't able to perform because you know his best friend did that to him, someone that he loved or whatever. And it just seems like that could have been more. And then now, I mean, because they did the small thing in NXT 
where it was his it's the Sami Zayn's redemption, where he beat top guys a few weeks in a row before he got his title shot against Neville. I just want, like I said, I just want to see more sides of the Sami Zayn character. Like, like I said, with Mick Foley, it was like he was this deranged dude, and then you saw you started showing the many faces of Foley, and it's just like I'd like to see another side of Sami Zayn. And hopefully they will, because when unless something you know drastic happens, I think he's going to be around for the long haul. Um, but yeah, over. Did you have any other opinions on the match itself? On the match itself, I thought they had amazing chemistry. The way it ended perfectly, because Sami Zayn, you know, again he's the character. He's gonna always be so close, and then he'll get uh, cheated and and get cheated out of things. So that's pretty much the way I feel like he should lose pretty much every match if you're gonna stick with this character. The Miz and Maurice dynamic is amazing. I don't know. I don't know how much time they put in it before they actually. They, you know, brought her all the way back, but it just seems so natural, and they, and it's funny, because they step on each other's lines sometimes, and it's, and it works even more because of that, because you can't really tell who's the boss of the relationship. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, they, they do work am- amazingly well together, and they should, considering they're, you know, a married couple, for Pete's sake. Uh, so, yeah, uh, and, and you're right, that's, if you're, when Sammy loses, he needs to come super close and then get screwed. And that also sets, like like I mentioned earlier, it it set it plants the seed for future possible future feud between the two. And who would have thought that you know the Miz would have these great matches this year? Because I yeah. think when you think of the Miz, you don't think great wrestler. Uh, yeah, and a lot of people, Dolph Ziggler's a big on that. He hates that people think that. He does wrestle, uh, you know, the WWE style because, you know, pretty much, I mean, for most of his training came from WWE, but he he pretty much, he put, can put on a good match. He's like, he's more like the John Cena of Hills. He needs a good dance partner. Yeah, you're right. Um, so up next was the Tag Team Elimination uh, Survivor Series match. We had Team Raw with The New Day, Sheamus and Cesaro, Enzo Amore and Colin Cassidy, The Shining Stars, and Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson taking on Team SmackDown of Heath Slater and Rhino, The Hype Bros, American Alpha, Brazongo, and The Usos. Um, Okay, so the thing, my first few takeaways from this is one, I was amazed that uh, The New Day were eliminated that quickly. Because I kind of figured they would win the whole thing, um, and this this really I should have this I think this match more than anything else set the stage for what was to come for the rest of this pay per view. Is where is the 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 Miz Sammy match? Once that match happened, you kind of knew what was going to happen with the cruiserweight match. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with this one, it was you got a a shock elimination right in the beginning. I mean, it was one thing when. Was it one of the shining stars was eliminated first? I can't, I didn't even write down the order of the eliminations or anything like Me that. Uh, but someone was Brazongo eliminated. was first. That's right, Brazongo was first, and which sucks because they were so good handing out tickets. Oh, I see a lot of potential actually in that team, but then you know they were eliminated by Kofi, and uh, and then Kofi ate a super kick and was eliminated. And Xavier's reaction on the floor was fantastic. I mean, he's, he's very good at that. He is so good at that. Um, and it was a shame that we didn't get him throughout the entire match reacting. Uh, but this set up for the shock value. Like All the things I think most people thought were going to happen on the show didn't happen at all. And this was one of them. And uh, the New Day getting eliminated super fast. Uh then the other things that really stood out to me, there was a moment where Chad Gable did a crazy ass dive onto the floor. Uh, mm-hmm. He is so good. He is so good. If he was just like f- three to six inches taller, he would probably be world champion right now. He is that freaking good. Uh, he's, yeah, I mean, he's good. And then, like I said, I, I definitely agree with the whole idea of being six two and everything. But as far as the tag team division, 
he, he him and Jordan are I mean seriously they are prepared they have everything you need to be one of the great tag teams oh. as far as the drawing power who they are and how their abilities and stuff and uh they're they're using that um, top rope bulldog now so oh really yeah need- that nice little nod to the Steiner brothers, I, I think, I thought was great. Uh, I actually also really liked how the announcers did a good job of putting American Alpha over. I want to say it was JBL. No, wait, he's on SmackDown. One of the the Raw guys was saying, you know, that this this of all the teams, this is the one that they were the most worried about. Uh, yeah, I thought that was really good. Um, there was a moment, and I don't remember the exact things happening, but uh, Slater was getting just destroyed and the crowd started chanting he's got kids uh mm-hmm. which made me laugh hysterically and then the the finish were you as shocked as i was um let me just say this at the moment yes and that's why i love this match and i love i've loved a lot of this pay-per-view because of the shock value who won who when they got eliminated and yes i i just felt like okay the raw one the first one it's got to go to smackdown this time and and they didn't and it was like oh this is awesome uh i was very shocked to the uh, side noted that uh they did not cast did not look more over in this match even though he didn't take the pinfall, I just figured they were going to try to make him look pretty freaking dominant. Yeah, was, and he really didn't. I mean, I thought I thought they did. He didn't pretty, really compete a lot in the match. Yeah, and I'm trying to. How, they were who pinned Enzo? Was it? I fuck. I can't even remember. Um. Okay, Usos eliminated. I thought uh, they made Enzo tap out. Okay, that's right. Um, I thought Carl Anderson and Gallows looked good in this match. I thought the Usos looked great. Um, I th- American Alpha looked really good. Really, the only people that looked like jokes were um, were Brazango and the Shining Stars. I thought otherwise, all the teams looked pretty darn good. And they're the two joke tag teams. I like the the fact that uh Gallows and Anderson and eliminated Jordan and Gable. That was great because they are definitely on the opposite sides of tag teams, but it also makes the again Gallows and Anderson uh, look really good. They're doing a really good job keeping them relevant because they are probably, I mean, uh, they are probably as far as a functioning tag team, them and then Jordan and Gable as far as the best tag teams, even though I'm really, really high on the Usos right now. The tag team division is so, so strong right now that it's like everybody's my favorite tag team. It's surprisingly strong considering how few tag teams there are, but it's like all of them are really good. And you know they're they're trying – It's they're in this real almost um, – they've almost you know painted themselves into a corner because you know they want New Day to break Demolition's record. So we kind of all know that's going to happen. And you kind of, we I think we all kind of expect that uh, Gallows and Anderson will be the ones, if the Revival don't show up on Raw, Gallows and Anderson will be the ones to to defeat the New Day and take the belts. Uh, I'm starting to feel like it's going to be Sheamus and Cesaro. I think they really like this storyline. I don't think the storyline's over, but I feel like the WWE really likes the storyline. They probably do. And I think that team is more over than it really should be, because what's great is is, is this team has made people like Cesaro more and hate Sheamus more. And uh, just like I did, you know how I've been doing my most over for shows, I also did a most hated for this show, uh, which we'll get to in a minute. But one half of that tag team is on that list. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I love... I just... When, when that was over, I was like, wait, Cesaro and Sheamus won? Are you serious? That, I was like, what the... What? That was, I think, of... That might have been the most shocking thing of the evening, even considering the the main event. That was just... Because they're such... They shouldn't work as a tag team. And, and it uh, does. And it does. And the other thing that I really like, because I'm not a fan of Sheamus, he works so well with Cesaro that you are getting the best out of Sheamus right now. 
um, with the two of them working together as this tag team that hate each other. Uh, it, it's just... And, and you know, I try to break down what works, what works about it. The thing is, Sheamus is boring, right? Yes. And he's been doing the same five or basic moveset his whole career. Well, the thing about it, the reason he really, really works right now is because Cesaro does most of the wrestling. And Sheamus comes in, does his one of his moves, and it really does break up the monotony of a boring-ass Sheamus match. Very, very true. Very and, true. Because I'm like, it really does. Because I'm like, oh, man, he did the Irish cross backbreaker. Okay, that's really awesome. Okay, now Sheamus, now Cesaro gets in the ring and does his more entertaining style than uh, Seamus does. So it's like you have this really entertaining style, this really powerhouse style, and it's like it honestly is how like it was with Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns now is kind of like uh, he's vanilla, but when he would come in after Dean and Seth did all the real wrestling and just hit those power moves, it really drove home, and that's kind of what you get with Seamus. And something that happens later on in the evening uh just goes just really drives that nail home that Roman Reigns desperately needs to be in a faction and not be by himself. He needs to be there to accessorize with other people because he works it, it's night and day the difference when he is with certain individuals and he he works with them versus him being by himself. Um so so yeah, so the next match up was uh the Cruiserweight Championship match, uh, Brian Kendrick against Kalisto. If Kalisto wins, the entire division heads over to SmackDown, which is where it really should be. Uh, but because the Intercontinental title did not change, we all, ha- I think, knew that at this point that Brian Kendrick was going to keep the title, and he did. Uh, there was a really good vignette uh, about Kendrick before the match, uh, which just shocked me that it even included the, the clip of him uh, performing Burning Hammer on Kota Ibushi and he came out and still no one cared. <laughs> it it was just, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I just, like I said, I felt like from the TJP section, I and this is nothing at uh, TJ Perkins because I think he's an amazing wrestler, they didn't pick someone with enough personality to carry their division. Uh, even if it was Rich Swan or Cedric Alexander or anybody else, even Tony Nese, it's just they didn't have a person with enough personality to carry their division. And it, and it's like you had TJP, and I think he being there, them droning on the fact that he was homeless and all that stuff really made people not care about the cruiserweight division. And then you gave it to Brian Kendrick, who is great, who is entertaining, who has a comparable storyline, but I think a lot of people had already checked out of the cruiserweight division. Agreed. And it's I think part of the problem was is they were really hoping that by the end of that they would have convinced either Kota Ibushi or uh Zack Saber Jr. to sign. And I think had Ibushi signed, he would have won. He would have walked away with that title. Um and he would I mean, it would be a whole different ball of wax. Um, but Kota Ibushi's move set would get the crowd into it. Oh, like yeah. those kicks, he has Tajiri like kicks, and then he could uh, the, the move of like with the uh, sky high or what what they call it, the last ride power bomb is a move that people are familiar with. And he's just you know he's over as a wrestler, and it would have been top notch wrestling. And that being said, it does suck. Like I said, TJP, he's going to be saddled with the person that caused us to fail. But it was just like, you know, when they talk about miscasting, it was like he was miscast as the face of the cruiserweight division. Yeah, he was. And and that's and you're right. It's a shame because he's a really good wrestler. He needs a heel turn. He because he just he needs to do something different. Uh, he also needs to stop dabbing because that is so over. Um, See, and, and that's the whole thing. I don't mind the dabbing. I don't really do. I know it's over, but that's kind of wrestling. They come generally come in a little after something was popular. So I've been dealing with that my whole life. So I'm okay with the dabbing. But in, when he was doing it 
in in the cruiserweight division. It came off more Hill. It came off as he was this cocky dude, and it was just like that cocky attitude never came across in his interviews, never came across in his wrestling style after that. It was like they dumbed it down, and it was just like they did everything they could for the cruiserweight division not to work. Yeah, they really did. And, and uh, it, it it's a shame. Yeah, he he would be much better as as the cocky, brash uh, heel uh, you know, one thing though, I will have to give credit where credit is due to a couple of wrestlers who were uh, ahead of the times. The Usos were dabbing way before it became a thing. Yes, they and, were, and they stopped as soon as it kind of became a thing. And they were like, "Oh, this is about to be over. We're going to stop this now." So uh, well, the thing about the Usos, and I, I, I give my little self a pat on the back. I called a year ago. A year ago, I've I've been saying that they should be heel. That I, after I started watching them up, 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 down, down, and I started kind of paying attention to who they are outside of the ring, their attitudes, who they are as people, is, are heels. I mean, not not saying they're bad dudes. But I'm saying they're really cocky, really competitive. It lends more to a heel casting than a face casting. And I was just like, when they changed, when they turned, it, it reinvigorated their characters, and it's so natural for them. It doesn't even look like they have to try. Agreed. Yeah, I. It, it looks like they were when they were faces, they would be jumping around, throwing their hands up, and they were trying to do everything they could to get a reaction. But and it was like, and it felt like that they were trying. But the fact is, they're so good. I mean, as heels, they don't have to try to get a reaction. They just wrestle a match, and everyone hates them. And that heel turn was so perfect because it was such the, oh, we've done everything you guys have asked of us, and you're gonna you're gonna crap on us. Well, we'll screw you. Because we team with Roman. <laughs> yeah, because our cousin, we have our cousin's back, and, and that eventually that needs to be the heel turn for Roman Reigns which, of course, we know is not going to happen. But um, there was a spot in this match, back to the Kendrick Kalisto match, that I thought was just absolutely brutal. And that was the reverse headlock takeover from the top rope that Kendrick yes. did on Kalisto. Oh, my God, Kalisto oh. took it so perfectly. And yeah. this lends to the whole idea. When Kalisto has a guy that's used to working with luchadors, he puts on great matches. And I was thinking about that because you mentioned that in last week's show. And as I was watching this match, I was like, yep, you get him there in there with people who are familiar with this style. This kid is really good. I see why they signed him. Yeah, and his uh, first match, his first match in NXT, uh, I remember he I, I can't remember who he worked with, but it was another smaller guy, and I was immediately like all about Kalisto. And everything they've done with him since then was like trying to erase that first NXT match, and I was like, he's so good. And it, and like I said, I wanted a few people that could probably work with him with Sin Cara, and they had him tagging with him. And you know, actually, I thought they were a pretty good tag team. I did. I, I, I thought there was some energy to them. I, I, I did the whole the Lucha thing. I, I, I definitely got them as a tag team. They weren't my favorite tag team, of course, but uh, I definitely got them as a tag team. And But it was just like his whole, like I said, his style. They would work with a lot of people that weren't good at with the Lucha style. I remember the first thing I really remember seeing there was a takeover, and I can't remember which one, but he he tagged with uh, the Rodriguez guy who used to be... Um, yes, yes. Uh, what's his name's announcer? Del yeah, Del oh, yeah. Rios. And they went against the Ascension, and it just was bad. It was so yeah. bad. <laughs> El local. Yeah, that was... Oh, that was awful. Um, but Brian Kendrick... I, retained, I, was like, I felt like it was an El Generico ripoff. Yeah, it, it was... It, I think it was, hey, we have nothing else for these guys to do. Let's just throw this together. we got to have fun. Um, <laughs> that's exactly I, I what think, it felt like. I don't know if we can make a top five on this, but he was definitely the person I can say his body did not very match the wrestling style that he had. That dude had no physique whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No, he did not. And I, oh, that would be a hard one. You could, you could throw Kevin Owens into that list. Yes. Uh, but all right, well, let's move on. We've got the uh, semi main event, the five on five men's elimination survivor series match. We had team SmackDown of AJ Styles, Dean Ambrose, Randy Orton, Shane McMahon, and Bray Wyatt with James Ellsworth in their corner taking on Team Raw of Kevin Owens, Chris Jericho, Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, and Braun Strowman. And uh, what do we want? Uh, I, I, I don't want to be too hyperbolic because I, I don't like to be like, oh, but recent history. This is probably the best multi-man match I've ever seen. Okay. I felt like it came in with its check marks. What we want to do. And it hit on all of them. Yeah. I do. I remember. I know it was like almost an hour long. It never felt long to me. It I, never felt long. I enjoyed all of it. Uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed Ellsworth. Uh, him causing Strowman to be eliminated. Just, Perfect the, way for Strowman to be eliminated. Exactly. I mean, the, he still looks super strong. And then his his basically murdering of Ellsworth afterwards, throwing him through those tables, and uh, that looked just fantastic. Um, but before that, Shane's elbow off the top rope onto Strowman through the table was, mm-hmm. was great. Um, the moment, and they made him look strong by saying... If you put him through a table, and he still would have beat the ten count. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That was uh, that whole that was good. Yeah, it really did. I mean, it was uh, some of some of the sh- stuff with Shane took me out a little bit here and there. Mostly when he was trying to do his rapid fire punching, which doesn't look that great. Um, oh God. Yeah, his punching is so so bad. It, but you know what? He looks like the non wrestler in a group full of wrestlers. Yeah, he does. The I was real seriously worried though when he did his jump across the ring and Roman hit that spear because it just I think they both got hurt in that because it, the way Roman hit, I think the t- the timing had to have been off because first of all his shoulder went straight basically into Shane's chest into like almost right about where your heart is, and then. Where's- I mean, where a good spear would go, yes. Right. And then the way he landed, it, he literally landed straight with his shoulder digging into Shane, and which subsequently made his head smack the mat. Uh, and they both looked like they were dead afterwards. And then there was the botch, which I think Shane was just like, oh, my God, I'm hurting, and lifted his shoulder up on accident. Mm. And then the ref was like, oh, crap. What do we do? Because I'm supposed to, if the shoulder comes up, I'm not supposed to count three. Uh, well, we're calling the man. And he's out. <laughs> I, I think, you know, maybe that's not why, how he was supposed to go out, but he couldn't continue. Uh, or it, it might have been a reflex. But the whole thing about the spear, I can honestly say this, and this is a complete nod to Shane. I've seen him take some of the stupidest bumps ever that I honestly wasn't worried about. I'm like, man, that looked really good. That kind of thing. And then it was like, I really wasn't worried about him. Because when they did the whole thing where Kurt Angle tried to suplex him through the glass and it didn't go through, and then he did it again. And it's like, oh, my God, he's dead. And <laughs> every time I think, oh, my God, he's dead, Shane's just fine. And and that's how, I, it, in my mind, I felt like, oh, Shane's fine. And that probably is the biggest like line of respect I could give him is that at no point was I actually worried about his well being because Shane is t- like tough. He is like if he got the right training and everything like that, he probably could have been a very very like amazing wrestler. Even as untrained as he is, he's really good. But I'm just saying if that was what he did for a living at some point. Like, that's what he did to put food on the table. He probably would have been one of the better ones. Yeah, you're right. One thing I will, skipping ahead for just a second, another thing I loved about his performance is two days later on SmackDown, he was still selling it. Exactly. Oh, my God, you don't understand what that did for me. It's like the Ellsworth selling, going through the table. It was just like, you have to, to me, 
you're you're suspending disbelief for a long time on these shows and some a lot of things that are ridiculous you have to sell the importance of the big spots and the big matches exactly you're right and then we have the shock ending of uh, randy orton and bray wyatt being the sole survivors and the crowd going absolutely berserk when bray hit that sister abigail and pinned roman reigns um, they loved that. Uh, I, I did too. I, I can honestly say the ending of the match, the like the last half of the match where they actually hit, where we have the the moment with the shield, but and then we got to these last two, and it was like it's Seth and Roman against Bray and Randy, and it's just like the four you could. I mean, if you said this was the four best wrestlers in the WWE, it would be hard to argue that. You're right. I mean, you, you could. I mean, that is just both of those teams in general. It's hard to argue against that those aren't, you know, ten of the best wrestlers yeah. in in the WWE right now. And yeah, I f- completely forgot the whole the Shield spot because you know Dean gets eliminated relatively early. And then comes back all super wicked pissed. And then that great shield reunion because, you know, the one thing he hates more than than uh, than Seth Rollins, who stabbed him in the back, apparently is AJ Styles. My whole thing with this is, and it's going to go more when we talk to SmackDown, there should have been more repercussions for this action. Yeah. yeah. As much as you build up Survivor Series... There should have been much more repercussions for the actions. Agreed. And and the other thing I would have liked, it would have been nice to see to have seen them do the whole fist thing. After oh, yes. that. Yeah, that would have been awesome. That would have been cool. And and I, at some point, I think we will get another. They're going to do little mini reunions probably until these guys retire. Because th- these three guys will be absolutely, their entire careers are going to be defined by each other. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think we're eventually going to get the Shield triple threat for the world title at a WrestleMania. I hope so. Uh, I really do, and because I think that would be fantastic. The triple threat match they had um, for the because weren't they weren't they in a triple threat match already? Yes, the three but I'm just saying this on the grandest stage of them all in the main event would be amazing. Oh yeah, because you have you you can. One cannot argue against the fact that the three most important people to the WWE in the last, you know, four years, four to five years, have been those guys in the Shield. They, yeah, they probably main evented more TV pay per views and house shows than anyone. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, this ending with the Wyatt family standing strong, Randy Orton eating a spear. To save Bray, uh, Luke Harper appearing out of nowhere, looking like an, uh, an absolute beast, which makes him losing to Kane earlier in the night even that more perplexing. Uh, this was, I loved the fact that Bray was the one standing tall at the end. Um, because it, one, of, of everyone in that match, the person who needed a big pay-per-view win more than anyone else was Bray Wyatt. Bray, Bray Wyatt is very much the Jake Roberts of our time. He doesn't need a belt. He's over. He really doesn't. I would love for him to be world champion. I would love for them to take this whole whole sister Abigail Bray Wyatt family, him fighting against the power. I would love to take the, them to take it to the next level, but it's really not needed because he sells shirts. On, she sells shirts. And when his entrance is the probably one of the most over things in the WWE consistently. I mean, there's other things that get spikes, but his entrance is consistently one of the most over things. Yeah, no matter how bad they've booked him, how many times he's jobbed out, when that music hits, it's the, those lights go on, on, on the fireflies come out uh, every single time. Uh, it's, it's always a sight to behold. Uh, I would love someday, because they teased him getting in Triple H's face. At some point, Bray needs a babyface run where he is going against who, whatever kind of bad, author, evil authority figure there is, and he gets a comeuppance on them. Maybe he's the one that finally gets comeuppance on, on Stephanie someday. 
and yeah. and stands tall holding the world title or the you know, whichever world title it is um even if it's just one run i think he, he he it would be great you're right he's like jake roberts he doesn't need the belt but it would be great for him to have it and uh him winning this match was fantastic and uh a big takeaway from that last 3 is that of the 3 of the last 4 you had like two third generational wrestlers and then Roman Reigns, who I think technically is a second generational wrestler, but he came so late in his father's life, he almost comes off like a third generational wrestler. And it's just like you had so much lineage in that ring of Mick Carters who have passed their craft on to their kids and they have done well with it and they are, they are bringing it on and they've all taken a step up. Bob Rainey's taking a step up from where Bob was. Um, you know, uh, Bray definitely taking a step up from where uh, IRS was. And then Roman, you know, he's become the, uh, like a main eventer, and his father was in the tag team for over, like 20 years. It's just what they do, what they've done is uh, great, and it's like in definitely connecting my childhood with what I watch now. And that's amazing to me. And the fact that we got the new guy, Seth Rollins, who, you know, he definitely comes off as the brash guy. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, it's like I said, it's wrestling. That that four right there was just what I, I've loved about wrestling my whole life, just in one package. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't say it any better. And it was also, it was kind of, you know, Randy Orton's of of one generation of WWE superstars, and the rest of them are of this newer generation. And so it was it was nice seeing, in a way, the passing of the torch or or the older guard saying, "We believe in you guys. We know you guys are the future." It was the, the whole thing was really cool. I thought I thought that was an you know top to bottom it was an excellent match. Um, even the little things that irked me in it were just minuscule, and I enjoyed the hell out of it. Uh, and if the pay per view stopped here, it was an A. So that brings us to the main <laughs> event: Goldberg returning after twelve years of not wrestling, facing Brock Lesnar with Paul Heyman in the in his corner. A match that lasted all of. One minute and 26 seconds. Uh, so just to break down this match, this is literally what happened. Uh, bell rings. They stare at each other. Brock picks up um, Goldberg, runs him into the corner. Um, Goldberg shoves Brock to the ground. Brock's face tells the entire story of the, oh, holy shit, what did I just step in? Um he he gets up. He eats a brutal spear, and in that one spear, Goldberg made everyone else who does spears look bad. I've got to say. Um, then Brock gets eventually after selling the spear for a good you know fifteen twenty seconds gets up, eats another equally as wicked looking spear, eats a jackhammer, and the match is over. Um, so I went into this. I actually. <laughs> My viewing of Survivor Series was on Monday of last week. I spent the entire day off and on watching Survivor Series. And by the time I got to this, I'd actually been spoiled about what happened. Um, So I knew going in what was going to happen, and it still didn't take away the shock of the whole thing. But the more I thought about it, the less it bothered me. But I want to get your take before I go into that. I was going to say, I was going to, I was actually going to say the opposite. I want to get your take before I go on my okay. rant. Well, my well then, then, then all the reasons this was not what I wanted it to be. Well, so, so here's, here's my take. And I've listened to a, a number of different shows throughout the week who've, who've given various opinions, pro and con about it. Um, but if you think about this from a fight standpoint, even if you you have two opponents where one is where it's a real mismatch, um, the the person who shouldn't win if they get a surprise hit in can win. So there's the whole shock factor there. Um, to Goldberg looks amazing. Uh, his promos have been better than they have ever been since he's been back. I never remembered him being 
a decent promo, and his promos have been on fire. And this guy has been so over in everywhere except Minneapolis that it is stupid how over this guy is. So if the point of all of this is to lead to WrestleMania, where the two have a big match and Brock gets his win back, this makes absolutely perfect sense. Uh, Because we get the next day, we find out Goldberg's going into the Royal Rumble, so it's probably pretty safe to say that Brock is going to screw Goldberg out of the Rumble, and that will lead up to a match at WrestleMania, which makes the whole thing make perfect sense. Um, Also, I thought Goldberg looked fantastic. Um, there, you, the two of them standing eye to eye. It look, I mean, they physically wise, they look like they're equals, or at least in the same ballpark. It's not like if you had Kalisto in there, or you know, back in the Rey Mysterio in there, and it's just so David and Goliath it hurts. Um, and then I like the way they organized the match. Uh, the story of Brock Lesnar coming in and even from the promos and the video packages, just saying, I'm going to kill you, son. I don't know why you think this is a good idea. You you don't bring your family because they're going to watch you die. And then getting hit out of nowhere. It's, it's that how many times have we seen in sports teams go into a situation so overconfident and get their asses handed to them This is actually something to know about the University of Oklahoma because it happens to them fairly regularly over the years. They walk into something where they should just win and cakewalk out of there, and they're overconfident, and they get their butts kicked. And that is the story they told in this match. I enjoyed it. I thought it was the right move, Um, especially if you're thinking about building to something else. If this was a one-and-done, no, 16 suplexes, F5, Lesnar wins. If you've got Goldberg until Mania and people are eating him up as much as they are, why stop cashing the checks? Okay. All right. So I see your point of view. And as far as a money situation, that's perfect. But uh, physically, in your opinion, who looks better? And this leads to my point. Maybe you agree with me. Maybe you don't. Uh, who looks physically better, John Cena or Goldberg? Um, I don't know. There's kind of in the same. There, I would exactly, put them in the same ballpark. Exactly, exactly what I was. That's the, exactly the point I'm getting to. I have been. I am a wrestling fan that pays way too much of it, and I am a fan. I have never been on the other side of the industry, so understand the psychology of putting the, together a match. And other, I, other than being a fan and being outside in, this is just a fan's opinion. You crapped on everybody on your roster. No one on your roster has been able to slow this dude down, uh, do anything to actually affect him in years. And then you take this 50-year-old man and he comes in and he beats this guy in 84 seconds. So legitimately, you're saying Goldberg is better than everybody on your roster. That is annoying. To me, that is disrespectful. He freaking dominates John Cena. The, the Pretty much the face of this generation of WWE wrestling in 20 minutes where John Cena maybe gets in two offensive moves. He beats up Roman Reigns. He beats up Seth Rollins. He freaking ended the Undertaker's streak. Goldberg does two moves. Brock Lesnar, oh, the thing about him is he's prepared. He's MMA. He's prepared for everything you like to do, and he can stop it. So you think at him laying there, and this is wrestling psychology, this is putting it all together, that he wouldn't know Goldberg's coming from a spear and wouldn't kick? He wouldn't do anything? Come on, man. The only person, the only people that should have done this are people on your current roster. When they say no one's taking the reins and becoming these big wrestlers, stuff like this is why not. 
you have just made Goldberg, even though he was drawing, you have just made him a bigger draw than anyone in your company. And now you have to pay him for it instead of taking one of your younger talents and letting them be Brock Lesnar and letting them get over. The Roman Reigns was a defensive tackle. He pretty much has the same pedigree as Goldberg. Why doesn't Roman Reigns beat him in 84 seconds? Because there would be a riot. That's no, why. Roman, Roman Reigns is huge. No, no, no I'm saying the fans would riot. And that's okay. The fans rioting is okay. But everybody was waiting on Roman to finally, you know, be the guy that beat Rock Lesnar. That match was what people were waiting on. He was going to be the guy that ended the streak because, I mean, ended his dominance because it made sense that you're putting a new guy as the face of your company. Now you take this old crappy dude and literally, you say he looks good, but he did two moves. Well, yes, anyone can get over looking two moves. James Ellsworth's uh, super kicks look amazing because he can do one move really, really well. well so, I- yes, yes. Oh, Goldberg, yes, money, the Royal Rumble, you just sold more tickets to the Rumble, you sold more tickets to WrestleMania for that short period. But for a bigger picture, there had to be someone on your current roster. So let, let's ask this. Let, let's do a comparison. Let's say um, a few years ago, and I'm uh, when I actually paid attention to football for about five minutes, uh, the University of Oklahoma was one of the biggest teams in. I think they were a top team in the in the Big Twelve. They okay. went into their game against OSU, the Bedlam game, and they got their asses handed to them. Now was, that is true. Now was that then a was that an insult to? Did that make? Was that a fluke, or was that now subsequently OSU is a better team than everyone that OU beat, or did they just literally have a fluke win? OSU won. I mean, they were the better team that day, and that made that made sense. So if if we're supposed to pretend this is a sport. Anyone on any given day can beat anyone else. That is true. But what two moves would you prepare for if you were fighting Goldberg? Agree. I I'm I'm not. I don't. Disagree I mean, with if you you're there. talking, you're talking legitimate. The one move Goldberg would never be able to get on Brock Lesnar, unless it's a super surprise situation, is the spear. But if you, and the fact that he would just sit there and wait for him and eat a spear, because that's basically what happened. Well, if you if you go back, he got watch, pushed down, so there was no oh, uh, there was no uh, point where oh, I'm so out cold that I don't know this big guy's about to run into me, right? Well, true, but I think he's, he's fully he's aware sold, of the situation. I don't know. I think he he sold it with his face because that utter shock and disbelief because we. It, and to me, that was that if really. That, if that built to the oh, okay, I'm going to take you more seriously now. And then they, I mean, I knew the match wasn't going to be that long. And then he starts taking them more seriously. That would have been great. But to just eat two spirits and the jackhammer, whatever. Yeah. I, oh no, I I totally get what you're saying. And I'm, and and there there's because you've got there's a ton of legitimacy to your argument. But if you just if you look at this match kind of in a vacuum, um, he hits the spear. Or no, he he shove uh, Goldberg shoves Lesnar down. Lesnar looks up at him in utter shock. Then, if you watch the way he gets up, which he puts his and it, obviously this is this they're told him when you get up, have your back to Goldberg because he gets up with his back to Goldberg. By the time he turns around, Goldberg is hitting him with the spear. It was perfectly timed. Because it was legit, I am now on my feet looking up, and his shoulder is in my gut. Uh, yes. That is how perfectly they time this. Um, so from from that standpoint, and, and at that point, it's it's a freight train hitting you. You're you're in a car wreck, and logic goes out the window. So from that standpoint, you're laying there going, "Oh, what the f- what the fuck just happened?" Um, and so, so that's why I I bought into this. Uh, well, let me add, and let me fit it. Let me add my one last point to this, and then because I'm like I said, it made me very angry. 
the greatest manager, the greatest talker of all time, who was prepared for any situation, any ever, is Paul Heyman. And he's the third man in this match. Well, okay, let's say Goldberg hits the spear. Let's say it's another spear. And he hits a jackhammer, and he's on top of him. Right? How is Paul Heyman not grabbing the referee, ending this match in a disqualification, or distracting him in some way where the match continues? Good good point. Um, the for, So the way I think of it this way, uh, a couple things. One, utter shock. Yeah. Uh, people forget when you are completely shocked, uh, logic, everything goes out the window. It's just your mind. If you are that shocked, you can just stand there and go, uh, 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 and not know what's going on. Um, so, so that's one way to explain that Two, Um, unlike when he was younger and more brash and, uh, and not caring about these things, he's older He's much larger, can't move as fast, and is terrified of Brock, of Bill Goldberg because Goldberg will eat him. So he's already been threatened by this guy. So from that standpoint, it's the shock and this guy will kill me. Makes To me, makes sense that why he wouldn't jump in the ring. Plus, the whole thing happened so damn fast. Yeah. That's the I, shock. like I said. It's just like for me, it was like it was fast, but for me, it was just like. But my, now th- this, my this, head hurt so much. I was like, "This is the dumbest thing I've ever seen." Well, then, and I, I now, hate that. You're right, and it, it does not take away from the fact that they this company has done a piss poor job creating new stars and to build someone up to be at that Brock Lesnar level. When I think of Brock Lesnar. I almost think of him separate from everyone else because he shows up whenever he wants, every great once in a while. And as far as day-to-day running of stories in WWE, he's honestly a non-factor. He doesn't come into play very often. So he's just this attraction that shows up every once in a while. Now, if we see that, so they, they've done a, we, we already know they've done a, a terrible job building up new stars, completely legitimate argument. One, I wholeheartedly agree with you on now. Let's, let's think about it this way. Does Lesnar losing this one match, especially if he destroys, uh, Goldberg at mania gets his win back. Does he really lose any of his luster? Really? Yes, it absolutely does. They're not going to be the guy that beat Lesnar. He's already lost to a fifty-year-old man. Yeah, he already lost to John Cena when he came back. He lost no, no, to a dick I'm kick from about, the Undertaker. He I'm lost. talking about. I'm talking about after the Undertaker, after the streak ended. He, Losing he, to John Cena before then, but since the streak ended, he has been on this unstoppable type of run. Except the Undertaker and, beat him. And the Undertaker, but they did it like I said. It was kind of like the Sami Zayn way. Undertaker tapped out. And then, and then he beat Brock Lesnar. So really, he didn't beat Brock Lesnar. Well, so let's let's think of it this way. Let's if it comes down to this, if we have WrestleMania, so if we go into the Royal Rumble, and Lesnar causes uh, Goldberg to be eliminated from the Royal Rumble, and they continue their feud to Mania, they have a great match where Lesnar just soundly wins. The next day on Raw. If Nakamura shows up and and Paul Heyman's doing his whole thing, there's no one else for us to beat. We've slayed that final demon. If Nakamura shows up and lays his ass out, does that take away, away anything from that moment? I Honestly, I am a wrestling fan that remembers moments. And the moment Goldberg beat Brock Lesnar will lay with me forever. Because to me, it completely took away from building up a new character. I mean, I can honestly say Nakamura coming in and winning would be impressive, and I'd be like, man, I didn't see that coming. Actually, I would be like, I saw that coming. Dave called that in November. <laughs> but uh, that being said, if they wanted to do it like that, maybe. But, I mean, they Brock Lesnar needs to go on quite a bit of a run for me to forget that he lost to a guy in 84 seconds. And maybe that's what he, maybe he actually starts coming back for the next few months and he starts just destroying people. But th- think of uh, think of this. So when Kevin Owens debuted on the mm-hmm. main roster and he powerbombed John Cena out of nowhere, 
and then had yes. that match at the Elimination Chamber when he won and beat John Cena. The fact that John Cena has lost to, on tons of pay-per-views to lots and lots of people, did that take anything away from the shock value or what that meant to Kevin Owens' career that he just pinned John Cena? And it was great until they made him lose the next two, three times yeah, that he fought John Cena. I'm not asking about I'm, I'm talking about this one moment. That one moment, no, it didn't take away from anything, but Kevin Owens was undefeated at that point. Kevin Owens was the guy. He was like, okay, this is this new generation, this new guy that we're going to build up that way. So it didn't really take away from anyone else. So I guess because the, you had never seen you had never seen Kevin Owens lose. True, but I guess what I'm asking is, and, and yeah, they did. They dropped the ball on, on that whole feud. Don't get me wrong. But the fact that John Cena has laid down for a lot of people over the years, um, did that knowing that he's been beaten by even a few Jamokes at times, take away it all from Kevin Owens. When did John Cena lose to a Jamoke? Well, John Cena losing is very rare. He lost to The Miz at WrestleMania. No, The Miz Miz was the amazing heel at that time. I was, oh my God, I had so many Miz shirts. So I was very high on The Miz at that time. And so I, I thought he was the heel of the company, and he was exactly what John Cena needed. And he didn't really lose. The Rock, the Rock bottomed him, and then the Miz pinned him. You know what I'm saying? Fair enough. That's how, like, how you lose. Very much tells the story of how your character continues in the future. Okay, so I misspoke there. I apologize. I guess what I'm just trying to say is, is we've got some guys that are on this whole other level that they will lose from time to time and it doesn't really take away from their luster. And I see Lesnar as kind of that guy. Um, and it's in a way it's a double edged sword. I mean, they're damned if they do damned if they don't Uh, on the one hand here, you are given an opportunity to sell a ton of tickets, a ton of t-shirts and a ton of network subscriptions. And yeah, it's with an old guy and it just goes to show every single failure that they have had uh, over the years of not building up new stars and the stars that they really try to build that don't go anywhere. I'm looking at you, Roman Reigns, um, failing at that. Yes. It, it, it just shines a bright light on that, but do I just not take advantage of it. I think it could have just been a more fluky win. Fair enough. And Fair that's enough. all I'm saying. It could have just come off as where, you know, Brock Lesnar uh, did something where he ran into the corner and hit his head on the post, and then Goldberg speared him and jackhammered him, and it was like, oh, okay, Brock Lesnar made this huge mistake. It just looked like physical, complete dominance, and if you're going to do that, why not do it to uh, someone that can be the face of your company, sell live tickets, sell T-shirts, sell other things other than this short five-month run they're about to give Goldberg. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. So uh, that was Survivor Series, and real quick, we're going to do our my most overs. Well, let me ask you. It, you you do have to admit though, those, those spears looked really good. They did, and, and like I said, they did. I mean, and let me. He was on one of my top spear list because again, a top five list. We did top five spears. He was on that list because it did. His looks amazing. I mean, every other person other than, like, I mean, like, Rhino sometimes looks fake because his is just him tackling you. You're just taking a tackle, and it sets up to another move, a more devastating move. That, you're right. So we, real quickly, um, on this show, we're going to do our most overs. Uh, I thought and th- this this was almost hard. I'm gonna have to rethink the way I I decide who is the most over, because damn near everyone was over on this show. I yeah. mean, it was Bailey got a huge pop, Sasha got a huge pop, Becky got a big pop. Uh, again, like I mentioned earlier, Ty Dillinger's ten is the most over thing the entire weekend. Sami Zayn was over, Cass and Enzo, the New Day, Slater, Heath Heath was, Heath Slater's awesome. Uh, Cesaro was over, Ellsworth was over, AJ, Dean, Seth, uh, Jericho, Owens, Goldberg. Yeah, it's all pretty over. hard to tell who the most over was. Yeah. Uh, the most hated was easy, Roman Reigns and Sheamus. 
Yeah. Uh, Sheamus was, was well, Ro- it was Roman Reigns, and then Sheamus was second place. Not too close, but you could definitely tell he was the other person. It was. It's almost like anymore there are, you have three potential reactions. Either you are over as fuck, no one cares, or they hate you. And that is and, the state right now. <laughs> yeah, and the funny thing with Roman is he does try to pull that John Cena is, uh, that, but they react. And I'm like, I wouldn't say that too much because you know how fans get. They'll quit reacting. They'll be like, oh, so us bullying you doesn't get the desired effect. So we'll just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Roman Reigns will come out and the crowd will just be dead. And, you know, except for his 12 fans out there. His little kids and the women. Yeah. I mean, like I said, Roman Reigns, I, I, I hate on him, but I don't have any problem with him as a wrestler. I really do. It's his whole thing with him is nothing personal. It's just how he's being booked. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. I, my whole thing with him is he's, it, it, my complaints, everything, every complaint I have with Roman Reigns has much more to do with the way the company has treated him. Because I was, um, I was looking over, some going through something we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, I was going through on our website, looking at some posts and looking at um, uh, the graphics I had built made for older episodes. And there was one where it was the one I think where Vince got arrested. And mm-hmm. there's this moment where, where he's, he's sitting there and he's holding the microphone for this cop and just the in it's it's hilarious cuz the look on he has on his face the whole time and he just kind of like sidles the microphone in there and then he he does the little shush motion at one point, and it was great and it's like why why can't we get more of this roman reigns um uh, and hell i even liked the uh the whole the suffer and succotash promo i hated the promo i loved the moment where he looked directly into the camera and winked i thought that was great um, so he has these moments where he's really good. His biggest problem is he's been shoved down people's throats. And, uh, and you notice as soon people will react well to him until they see that he's about to go for the world title. And then they're like, no, fuck this guy. Um, they like him. If, if, if you pair him off with, with Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins, they like him. If he is doing s- almost anything other than going for the main belt, He's okay uh, after the initial boo when he comes out. But as soon as he gets anywhere, sniffs that world title at all, people are like, nope, I hate you. That is true. Um, but let's go on to the next night. Well, um, yeah, next night, Raw, same building. Um, Goldberg came out just ridiculously over. Um, I Going for the title, I thought was... Uh, was interesting. Do you think there's any chance in hell Goldberg becomes champion again? I would say, as as uh, I was, that would be the day I stopped watching wrestling. But we all know that is an empty threat. So, I mean, I guess I would be depressed, and uh, I probably the next show would probably be my most silent show ever because. <laughs> I, I, I just hate that. I just want Goldberg to go away. I really, really, really want him to go away. <laughs> and and I, the fact that I am going to the Rumble, and I ha- I mean, I paid money, and I'm going to have to sit through Goldberg, it's a no. You know, I like Goldberg. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Goldberg had his run, and it was great, and I just wish he would have stayed away. My whole thing with Goldberg, I think... I think one of the reasons why it doesn't bother me as much is because it, to me, it's still nice. It, it, it's as much as I groan when attitude era folks come back and, Oh, we have to be saved by attitude era folks. You look at Goldberg and he had an extremely short run in WWE. So really he is completely sold on what he did in WCW. And it's to me, it's nice seeing a WCW guy getting a huge response. Um, so that that's, I think, part of the reason why it doesn't bother me quite as much. Um, because it's if, if for just one one moment, WCW gets one still little, little, you know, twist of the knife in there, just to say, yeah, we were important. You know, we weren't meaningless. 
Um, and maybe I'm just reading way too much into it. Uh, but yeah, it's, and the fact that he was gone for so long and he's, he's there now and he doesn't look like a bumbling idiot and he's actually cutting good promos. Uh, and that's really the shocking thing is how good his promos are. It's like, when was this guy ever good on the mic? He does a lot. I mean, he's done a lot of TV and charity work. I'm pretty sure he got a lot more comfortable talking. Yeah, that had to be it. So, you know, he had a segment, and then there was a, what was it, the the New Day had their match against uh, Sheamus and Cesaro. At one point, one of the announcers called them Shizaro, and that made me laugh. Um, that was a really good match. I remember that. Uh, did you have any other big takeaways from Raw? Um, I'm kind of scrolling through what happened. The Enzo Mori uh, naked man. That was hilarious. That was that was funny. That was really really funny. The Kevin Owens and Jericho segment where uh, they were pretending like they were breaking up and then they blamed it on Roman. I'm like, yes. And Toronto ate that up because you know blame everything on Roman works. Um, oh yeah, that pop was gigantic. Yes, they love blaming everything on Roman. The Strowman thing, uh, I didn't get just because they had, he had been begging for competition and they gave him Sami Zayn and then he beats beats him up before the match even starts and beats him up during the match. And like I said, that's Sami Zayn's character. I mean, I, I, he's uh, a ten times better Ells, Ellsworth. And... Um, so I don't get it. Like I said, I don't get it. I I didn't get Braun Strowman beating him up for the match. He didn't need that. I mean, he's super gigantic, so he didn't need that. I uh, liked in that match. I I loved the uh, this is something I wrote down. The please don't kill him chance. Yes, yeah, we're great. Yes. Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, Nia uh, looks like Nia and Sasha are about to do a feud. I'm actually interested in that feud. I want Sasha and Charlotte to get away from each other for a while. Uh, I'm just kind of going through the notes I took during the show. And last but not least, that main event, that was pay-per-view quality. That was amazing. The story they told, uh, everybody being banned from the ringside, Jericho, I thought they were going to do the thing where Jericho actually beats up Seth Rollins on the other side of the garter so he could say he never actually went to ringside, but then he just goes all in and goes in the ringside. And then that's how Kevin Owens wins, and I just love that he wins and keeps the titles in the most differently despicable ways. Every time he does it in a despicable way, it's a little different from the last time. Yeah, that was. I'm trying. I didn't take any notes on that match. I, I just. I remember that I really enjoyed it. Um, I think sometimes by the time the main event rolls around, I'm tired. <laughs> well, I mean, you had a four hour Survivor Series and then a three hour Raw. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Uh, my other. The only other things I had from this. Um, yeah, the. Uh, it kind of had to do with the cruiserweights. I thought Cedric Alexander got a really nice pop when he came out. Um, and by the end of his match, the crowd was really into him. Uh, he's just, he, that guy's going to be a breakout star. Um, and then the cruiserweight triple threat match, it took a while for the crowd to get into, but eventually they did win them over. Um, and uh, I, it helped that Rich Swan won. It's it's like, okay, well, let's take the only two people in this entire division who are over, Cedric Alexander and Rich Swan. And let's push them. That actually makes sense because they're the only two that anyone gives a crap about. Uh, and, and realistically, it's probably they would the, the audience would much rather see them wrestling the rest of the people on the roster. Yeah. Uh, and but can you handle this, man? And I do. I, I'm digging Rich Swan. I didn't like when he first came. I, I didn't like the fact he had. A, you know, he's really athletic, but he had a bit of a gut. And it was kind of weird. And he's actually looked like he's taking care of that. And I do like his, um, I do like the whole, can you handle this? Of course, that's why I'm like, I, I know it, you can't do hindsight is 2020, but I'm going to do a little bit right now. God, he would have been the first best cruiserweight champion coming out with the belt. Doing can you handle this? And oh, it's one of those things that would have got the crowd into it and automatically made them pay attention to the cruiserweight division. And oh, they yeah. would have been heartbroken when Brian Kendrick beat him. Oh, absolutely. It would have... 
yeah, that would have been that would have been so much better. And even hell, even you could make an argument Grand Metallic might have even been a better person to have held the belt first. Yeah. Um, but where has he been? Has he just is he finishing up dates in Mexico? I think they're doing that, and I think they want to reintroduce them and try to make them kind of bigger. Okay. You know, I think they want to really, like, really, re- uh, re- really introduce him like this as this amazing guy. Because, you know, they it, it does need a shot in the arm right now, the Cruiserweight division. I think 205 Live is going to be everything because I don't know. Are they going to – I guess they're going to do it with the SmackDown crowd. I think it works better with the – I think it be- works better with the – smaller NXT crowd, the more passionate fans. It's just but if you're going to do it, you know, do it big and they're yeah. going to try and I just hope they get to let them wrestle and I hope they'll let them tell their story and put on their show. Agreed. Yeah, it will uh it, a lot will depend on that. But one thing I think as as you get further away from pay-per-views, I've noticed that you know, the shows right after a pay-per-view tend to be in really big buildings. But some of the other shows, SmackDown seems to be running smaller buildings, mm-hmm. uh, so I think that will work in the in Two Hundred Five Live's favor. Also, just generally, I think the SmackDown audiences tend to be a little smarkier. Yeah, uh, which it's and we've talked about this before. It's really ironic that on paper you look at the two rosters, and really on paper the Raw roster is better. Yet SmackDown is such a better show, and on paper, SmackDown is the show that the casual fans you would think like more, but the casual fans, um, it, it's the Smarks who are going, SmackDown's the best show. Um, yes. it, and that has to do with booking. But uh, speaking of um, SmackDown, so did you have any thoughts from uh, from the SmackDown from this week? Uh, SmackDown. Oh my god, always my favorite show. Um, that main event with Ellsworth and AJ Styles, I'm, I'm not trying to skip the rest of the show, but this just, it, it just played so well. AJ and how he did it, um, it was just so well done. The Dean Ambrose part of it, it adds to their feud, and it's just, I'm just, it almost, like I said, I'm just running. Uh, running out of just positive things to say about AJ and James Ellsworth. James Ellsworth is moving up on my, my top list of sellers because that's all he does is sell. And he just does it. He looks like he's dead every time he gets hit. Every time he hits a big move, he looks like he died. And it is when he comes back, it is such a passionate type thing. And I'm just like, it's funny that Ellsworth has like, I think he's like four and one. As a singles competitor on SmackDown, if he's even, I mean, one no, because his one loss was on Raw or Strowman. He's dude's undefeated. <laughs> and I loved that, and that uh, Ambrose mentioned this one time, but it still rings true. He has more victories over AJ Styles than John Cena. Yes, that is, yeah, that that when he hit the uh, the no chin music, and then AJ got caught up in the ropes. Um, that final mo- that was that that was a fun match. And the, something that the, with SmackDown, a lot of times by the time I watch SmackDown, I'm I don't take very many notes, but I always sit back and I, I enjoy the show so much. Um, the the things that I really took away, I, Hyper Dean Ambrose, I think is really funny. Um, I just I know that he probably should do more, but I enjoyed that. Um, I also really don't understand Mojo Rawley's ring gear. Are those those like dad workout pants he's wearing? No, they're, they're shout outs to the eighties. Uh, that's what the road warriors used to wear, the Zubas. Oh God, those were not not in their good times. No, when no, they... no, no. Road warriors they never wore it as in ring gear. They only wore it outside. Like if you see a lot of their pictures from Japan, they were generally in tank tops and Zubas. Okay, okay, and then... it's just a. It's just a kind of a shout out to it, and it kind of goes into the wild character that is the uh, uh, Mojo Raleigh. You know, I'm he's just different. They're playing him off as just being really, really different. And he, he's I don't know what to think about him. He's really, really kind of not good. Uh, I 
but uh, there was uh, who was it? Uh, JBL had a really good uh, comment at one point when when um, Dean Ambrose was dressed up as the Mountie and his reaction. He's like, "What was that? The Lunatic Rougeau brother? I thought we were <laughs> rid of all of them. I thought it was hilarious." Yes. Uh, but my, he does he does make a lot of like insider if you haven't watched wrestling your whole life you would not get them from JBL you get that a lot and that's where JBL works well and I think him him with Mauro Ronaldo it makes him a lot better because he will come up with these just really good inside joke one liners that are 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 really funny I think um I did my big takeaway from from SmackDown this week was the four man announced team is really stinking awkward. Yes, uh, I agree. It doesn't like I said. It's like sometimes it just like you go a whole match or two whole segments, and Tom Phillips doesn't say a word. I forget he's there. Yeah, exactly. And then they remind us that oh, Tom Phillips is sitting here as the fourth spot. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it, it it's the whole thing really. I don't know what they're they're doing with this. Then, uh, then did you watch Talking Smack? Oh, I did want to have one more, oh, one more. Uh, okay. point from SmackDown. It's kind of like the overall arching. I paid too much attention to the storyline. So you've taken your time over the last month, actually two months. We've pretty much gotten a two month build up from Survivor Series, telling us how important it was for Raw to beat SmackDown, SmackDown to be Raw. Undertaker basically comes in and says, I'm going to beat you up if you lose. Okay, that's fine. I get all of that. Dean Ambrose joins the Raw, two Raw guys, and puts AJ Styles through, uh, through a table. And very shield moment, awesome moment. You then go back to SmackDown. So basically, Dean Ambrose turned on SmackDown. All right? Right. And and this was super important and this was the most important thing ever. But right now he has a title shot to represent your brand. How is he not stripped of the title shot or at least made to defend that title shot in the evening? They might actually do that before the pay per view. I the pay per view's next Sunday. Oh Jesus Christ. Oh yeah, yeah that's right. Them, yeah, I was about to say. I'm literally. I'm like. I'm gonna be there. I don't see them doing anything Tuesday. It just seems like there was this big event, and he completely gave them the middle finger, and there was no actual repercussions. I will chalk that up in storyline to because Shane mentioned it, but I chalk that up to Shane is so hurt he just doesn't have the energy to mess with him, and that okay. was the whole. Please leave. Just get out of here. I don't have it in me to deal with you right now. Well, um, maybe maybe they'll address it Tuesday. Hopefully, because yeah, you're right. That was that was kind of a a big deal. Um, but yeah. So, did you have anything else from SmackDown before we move on to Talking Smack? Because I was gonna say, if Jericho did it, it I mean, or let's say uh, Roman did it for SmackDown, it might have even been considered a heel turn. But it just seemed like, well, Dean's crazy, so Dean Cray does crazy things. So I get that part of it. But he, sh- I mean, even Dan- Daniel Bryan should have been more pissed. He didn't come off pissed at all. It's just, it just seemed it kind of taken away from the importance, which is Survivor Series. I think you could you could chalk that up to yes, they were pissed, but they won at the end, so their adulation over winning has overridden their anger at Dean for potentially causing them a loss. Yeah, for turning on his team. He literally turned on his team. Right, which you could you could rationalize as he turned on AJ Styles, who he hates, not necessarily the entire team, uh, which is what... He, so, yeah, you can... There, there are ways of looking at that, and that's that's I'm sure how how Dean would would yeah. rationalize it. But uh, that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Actually, I did not think of it that way. That makes sense. Yeah, because because yeah, that, to me it was all about. I hate AJ Styles. I've got to screw this guy over more than anything else. Um, but yeah, so talking smack. Did you watch it? Uh yes, I did. Actually. I thought this was a really good one. Daniel Bryan's rant about um, people being selfish. I thought was fantastic. And then his, his rant uh, dealing with the cruiserweights and just 
uh, WWE in general not making stars was also fantastic. And that yes, was I thought that was you, I, thought, you just, I thought he pretty much went on the internet and I'm not saying he did this at all, but I'm saying it seemed like he went on the internet and voiced every complaint every wrestling fan has. Well, I, I think he did that just because he probably feels the same way. Yeah. He is. I think he is far more in tune with the wrestling fans and the independent wrestlers than anyone in corporate WWE. And also, I think he does not give two Fs. Yeah, he, they, he wants them to fire him so he can go wrestle. <laughs> How quickly before he shows up in New Japan? When yeah. whenever his contract ends and the ninety days is up, he he shows up in either New Japan or Ring of Honor or both. Dude. And he shows up first night. Him versus Adam Page for the world title. Amazing. Oh, oh, can you? Oh, that would be so good. Some big pay per view. Some it's cold. Cold. yeah, some big pay per view. Cole's up there. I have no one else to beat. I've beaten everyone. And then Europe's the final countdown hits because that was his music in Ring of Honor. And Brian Danielson walks out and. Uh, and oh my God, people would lose their minds. Yeah, he wins. He wins the title, and you know, cuts a promo how good it feels to use his own name. It would be amazing. Ring of Honor would automatically become the number two company because yes, it's the most over thing ever. Yeah, I mean, and if they and they would have to, they would have to use that to propel themselves, which they probably wouldn't because Sinclair, I don't think, gives two craps about Ring of Honor. Uh, but yeah, that would be. That would be so yeah. cool. Um, so, yeah, I, I agree. I think it was Daniel Bryan just – he's so good in in his role on Talking Smack because he does – he so often says the things that fans are thinking. Um, I thought Jason Jordan and Chad Gable were actually pretty good on the show, how they were talking about, well, if you wanted to be the number one talking to Bray and saying if you wanted to be the number one contender, be in a match, they were very – good at very much keeping it as a legitimate sport like they care about winning and I thought that just came across really well I I don't know why but that just struck with me that they did a really good job on the show oh yeah I'd forgotten about that yeah that that is true um so They, they pretty much cut a legit promo like hey there is no WWE putting us over we're gonna beat them cause we're better than them type thing now that I mean, you you figure that uh, Bray and and um, Orton are going to win uh, through some. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think they're about to win the tag belts, and that I'm fine with that. I mean, it's especially if American Alpha is eventually the team that beats them. Uh, yes. So I agree. Because I mean, you you look at for God's sakes, Randy Orton's a 12 time world champion. And uh, and yeah, they're both third generation wrestlers. It it as great as American Alpha is, they're not quite there yet. So and then they got this monster as their backup, <laughs> Luke Harper. Oh, Luke Harper is so good. He is yeah. so so good. I I really I want man that that ladder match he had a couple years ago with uh with um Ziggler for the Intercontinental title it was on i think it was on the TLC show oh my god that was so good so he is such a good wrestler and it's a shame that he's not used more or better but uh maybe now with this new Wyatt family thing but uh but yeah that i think that'll be that'll be fun i'm looking is that match next week or is that going to be on the pay-per-view I think the match is next week, and I think they'll do a thing where whoever wins that match gets Heath and Rhino at the pay per view. That's something to look forward to. So, uh, so speaking of, so in it, so it's not. It is it is it really next Sunday? The pay-per-view? it's next Sunday. Literally, I mean, I'm going to be there. So yes, I absolutely know it's next Sunday. All right, where is is it in Dallas? It's in Dallas. All right, excellent. So we will be able to get some uh, some some behind the scenes and what it was like to be there vibes well, from you. And when I usually what I usually do and is I will watch it there and then I'll come home and watch it on the show. But for for just a more compare and contrast type thing, since we are going to 
start uh, recording like particular pay per view shows. I'm going to not. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to give you the completely live in how it felt inside the arena, and then you can give us the actual TV view. Excellent. So this is a perfect time to talk about something we are we've got going on. So uh, for a while we have had a YouTube channel which we just have not used. And over the weekend, uh, Floyd and I were talking about um, some some w- things we could do to use utilize the YouTube channel. And uh, for, if you want to check it out, it's YouTube.com forward slash Around the Ring. Okay, uh, just the same handle we use for everything for the show. And right now we have up there uh, our, a bunch of our top five segments that we do each week. And that's something that will continue each week after the show. Uh, after the show goes up, we will be putting the top five segment on the YouTube channel for people to check out. Um, but we're going to start doing, uh, recording on Monday mornings, uh, pay-per-view reviews. So uh, at every couple of weeks, however often they happen, uh, barring scheduling issues... We will, on Monday mornings, record an exclusive pay-per-view reviews for the YouTube channel. Our first one will be for TLC. We will do it that Monday. And so Floyd's going to bring us the uh, live-in-the-arena reactions. And I will talk about what we saw on the boob tube. And uh, we'll kind of go from there. We'll do our predictions for TLC on this normal Sunday show. Uh, and that we will see how yeah how we did the next day. Um, as of right now on the YouTube channel, we do have our I have put up our Takeover Toronto review. I went ahead and put that up there, and I will probably take out our Survivor Series review segment from this show and add it up there as well. Uh, but we will going forward have pay per view reviews specific um, that we record on Mondays for uh for the youtube channel so if you haven't subscribed or if you're if you haven't checked out before please do youtube.com forward slash around the ring okay so you can uh see what all we've got going on there and uh yeah yeah, most importantly with that i just feel like uh we want on the youtube channel on all this we want your comments we want your questions we want your ideas for top fives because we we can definitely use them we definitely want to be interactive with people our listeners and if we have any i definitely want to be interactive with uh with you guys because you know as far as the reason i don't listen to a lot of podcasts and this will be 100 percent true is because my opinion can't really go into it because I don't hear. And I'm going to, if it's your idea on the top five, I'm definitely going to give you a shout out. And I'm definitely going to let it be known that this person had a great idea. Uh, we got some good, we, from our uh, group on Facebook, we got some good uh, top fives for the future. And we can't wait to roll them out. And we're going to give credit every time we roll one of them out. Yes, yeah, we've had some uh, we've had some good discussion there in the in the Facebook group. It's called the Club. You can search for it on the Facebook and uh, request to join if you would like. That would be very cool. Um, so yeah, we're uh, we would I, I agree. I'd I'd like us to get some interaction from folks. Would be fantastic. So uh, we're going to keep plugging away, and hopefully this will be a, a great way to get uh, get some more interaction with everyone. Um, so so yeah, so that will uh, check that out. And we'll have some more videos up. And I will be going back and getting the rest of our top five segments. I think we've only got three or four more I need to put up on there. Uh, We've been doing this for a couple of months now. Um, And we'll get to this week's top five here in a minute. But before we do, uh, we still have a few other things to go through. Uh, NXT this week. What did you think of NXT? Okay. Because they really, they had to, I thought... Shinsuke did a good job on the backstage interview saying he wanted his rematch as quickly as possible. I thought that was really cool, and him looking dejected about losing. I thought that was cool. Um, I'm trying to remember the show, actually, because I remember watching it. I did watch it. (laughs) It it wasn't a very memorable show because it was recorded probably right before TakeOver went on the air. Okay. Um Sanity had a match against somebody, um, I forget who, or no, no, it was, uh... No, there was, uh, there was a singles match between Rich Swan and 
some big dude, right? And That's then right. Sanity, and Sanity just came in and beat them both up really Right, bad. it was the Hawaiian guy. Um, yeah. The big Hawaiian dude. And Rich Swan super over. Uh, so, yeah, and and Sanity was also very over. Specifically, Eric Young was super over. Well, yeah, duh, he's Canadian. Uh, EY, baby, forever. Yeah. One thing I will say, I think Eric Young is shopping at the War Machine store of Ring Gear. Mm-hmm. Uh, that he, that whatever that thing he was with, that needs to go away. That looks stupid. Um, they had a really good Mickey James interview from backstage. It almost makes you wonder if they're going to bring her back for more. Um, I Triple would be, H actually said the ball's in her court. They have offered her a full time contract. Oh, I hope she comes back because she even whether it's on NXT or on Raw or on SmackDown, she's really good, and I want to see more of her. I, I, maybe another match against uh, Asuka, uh, and then head up to you know one of the the um, other spots. Um, Maybe that leads to Magnus making a WWE debut or NXT debut because I actually really like Magnus. Magnus, sorry, that's when when I first really got back into wrestling. It was when when I was really f- starting to focus, paying attention. It was when Magnus won the uh, TNA World Championship from AJ in that uh, crazy manner, and uh, on the Don Tony and Kevin Castle show. They hated Magnus, and Don Tony would just rip into him, and just the way he would say Magnus's name cracks me up. So I forever will associate Magnus with with Don Tony saying the way he would say Magnus. But yeah, no, Magnus I think is a really good wrestler, completely misused in TNA. Uh, but yeah, the, the whole thing was he was set up to fail in TNA because they just went a completely different direction where they just literally got rid of all their established stars and decided to start working on the newer stars, which is kind of funny because just a random story from wrestling, Paul Heyman, Team A was trying to bring in Paul Heyman, right? Right. And this was doing the main event mafia, all that kind of stuff, and they were starting, they were really, they had some traction. And they asked you know, Paul Heyman basically to write them what he planned to do. And he's like, basically, I'm going to kill all the established stars and make brand new stars. And Dixie was loyal and said, you know what? Can't do it. I'm not going to bring you in, Paul Heyman. Which, imagine how that would have changed wrestling at that point. Uh, but um, at that point, and then years later, they bring in John Gabrick or whatever his name is. And he pretty much had the same idea, and they just did it in a horrible way. They built new. They didn't build new stars. They just killed the old ones. <laughs> yeah, though it did lead that when when Eric Young beat Magnus for the title, that was great. Yeah, that was a good moment, and it was just funny because it was such. They so ripped it for Daniel Bryan. Oh yeah, oh yeah, but it was still cool. I mean, and <laughs> and then but then the the truly sad thing about it in a lot of ways is TNA did a better better Daniel Bryan championship run with Eric Young than WWE did a Daniel Bryan championship run with Daniel Bryan. Well, Daniel Bryan got hurt because Daniel Bryan was fragile. True, but the whole, the thing with Kane, it was just it just... Yeah, I mean, it was was silly, but it was just like he had started having problems and they had to figure out a way to, you know, it was like because apparently, like, after he won the title after that weekend, he immediately started, they started noticing problems. That's, uh, yeah. man. So it was, it was a, it was a stretched out version of the Finn Balor thing. They just didn't take him out immediately. And, of course, Daniel Bryan was like, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. And then he started losing feeling in his arm, so he wasn't fine. Yeah, which makes as much as we all know he wants to get back in the ring. There's a part of me that hopes when his when his contract's over with uh, WWE that the the New Japan and ROH and as much as I want to see him show up, there's this part of me that's like I don't want this man to die or become a cripple. That hopes that they just say no, we're you're not going to die in our ring. You're not going to become a paraplegic in our ring. Um, because it's bless his heart, he just he wants to wrestle so bad, and you know physically he looks great. He just can't. He's taken too much head trauma, and you, you're not. People aren't designed 
to to take that. I mean, just for God's sakes, all you have to do is look at what happened with Chris Benoit and know that you can't be beaten in the head for that long, that severely, and not have consequences. He's at the point he can walk away, and maybe once Bree pops out this kid, he'll change his mind and go, you know what, this behind-the-scenes stuff isn't so bad. And uh, I can, you know, maybe he'll have a change of heart. We'll we'll see. A um, couple other things I, I thought on uh, on NXT this week. The, the women's match, I thought... Liv Morgan did a really good job pulling out some new moves that she really hasn't used before. Um, oh, yeah, six-man match. I forget, six-woman match. Yeah, uh, though the the finish with uh, Ember Moon doing the O-Face looked really bad. Poor um, MMA girl uh, just did not was not in position right, because that's a, that's a difficult move, because that, that move depends as much on the person taking it as it does yeah. the person delivering it. It, it, it. It's almost completely the person taking it. Yeah. Because, in essence, your body would necessarily move backwards and not down, so you have to, you're is mostly responsible for making that move and it looked horrible. It did, it did, and so much to the point that I was a little worried that she might have legitimately gotten hurt. Me too. Yeah. Uh, they also announced that the Joe Nakamura rematch will take place in Osaka, Japan. Um, so I really hope that's a network special and not just some house show. Uh, and if it's not a network special, that match needs to be filmed and shown on an episode of NXT. Uh, now one thing, I want to get your opinion on this, because this is something I think Solomonster brought up on his show, which his thought was... You have the rematch in Japan, you have Nakamura win the title back, and then the takeover that is in Royal Rumble weekend, you have the blow-off match, make it a loser-leave-town match, and at that point, whoever loses is the one that you see on the main roster, you know, at Royal Rumble or whatever. Uh, what, what do you think about if they did something like that? That would be a very interesting way to do it uh, in that way. Um, I'm hoping Joe debuts. I would hope Joe debuts at the Rumble. It uh, would definitely uh, add to the whole, you know, like huge debuts at the Rumble. with the, um, And so it, I could buy it either way. I really could. I don't want Nakamura to win it in Japan, but it actually makes sense. I can't argue against it. Yeah, that's that's my thought. It's it all depends on who they who they're going to bring to the main roster first, and what their kind of long term planning is. Because this either needs to be Joe holds onto this belt for a long time, and here in a few months Nakamura goes up, or Nakamura wins the belt and holds it for a long time, and Joe goes up. No, that, Nakamura has done his time. I really think. I mean, he is like thirty six, thirty seven. I don't think he has years to stay in NXT. I I think he should be the next call up personally. I you know I would be, I'm completely cool with that. So if he, let's say he, and honestly you could make the same argument about Joe, but let's say Nakamura loses in Japan, and then they have a loser leave town match at Takeover, and then he's number three or number thirty or whatever at the Rumble. Uh, would be would be huge. My thing with Joe is I think he'll get lost on the main roster. I prefer him in NXT, and if they bring him to the main roster, I hope they have a very specific storyline and plan for him. Because as much as Joe is good, his his role is kind of the same as Brock Lesnar's. He's the ass kicker. I mean, that's what he does. He beats people up. Joe doesn't really work without a title. So you'd have to bring him up and bring put him up, put a he has to be going after a belt like at all times. And like I said in the main roster, it seemed like they have very good ideas what they're planning with the Intercontinental and the US title. So I don't know where he would fit in. Yeah, the only he's thing definitely, he's definitely a mid Carter as opposed to Nakamura steps into the main event pitcher. And you can really never have too many guys fighting in the main event pitcher. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I would see Joe... To me, it would make sense for Joe to go to immediately after Roman Reigns, mm-hmm. uh, as long as they let him beat Roman. Because yeah. if, if Roman beats Joe, then Joe's dead. 
Exactly, and that's what I think is more in danger of happening once Joe gets to the roster. I think Joe is variable, and I don't think Nakamura is. His entrance is just the most over thing ever. Yes, and as you you mentioned on, we were talking online yesterday that you heard in, you were watching a football game, and yeah. the arena was playing Nakamura's entrance music. Yep, yeah. I was like, is it? And I and I actually paused it, rewind it, and I was like, that is Nakamura's entrance music. I made sure I was hearing it right. Yep, there you go. All right, so um, we're going to do a couple of other things before we get into our top five. Uh, one is um, on this, they're both indie related. So WWN, which is the the kind of main family that is over uh, Evolve, Shine, Dragon Gate USA, which doesn't really exist anymore, uh, and a couple of other promotions have announced that they are introducing a WWN title. Uh, that, now, they're part now of the Flow Slam network, which uh, Flow Slam is a kind of like a WWE network type service, though I think it's about 20 bucks a month. Uh, you get with that, you get everything Evolve has ever done as part of it. I think you get everything Shine has ever done. You get you get all of their new pay per views going forward, all of the WWN Super Shows, the whole thing. But they're creating a belt that will represent, basically, be a belt that is over all of the brands. It can be defended at any show and at the Super Shows. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think this leads to eventually WWN just becoming something and the others? kind of folding into WWN or what did you have any thoughts on this? I didn't really, but now that you say it like that, and they maybe do it like a NWA type thing where, uh, the WWN champion, you know, is the committee as far as over it. And the WWN is like the governing body. And then there's the little companies because what people don't realize is the territory thing really did, does work. It worked. It's just WWE came up with a different business model. But that doesn't mean that territory thing can't still work as far as as long as you're understanding it's smaller shows and they're more intimate indie crowds. So I could see it working like that. Yeah. And so here, here's the actual list of the WWN family. It is Evolve, Shine, Full Impact Pro, Style Battle, American Combat Wrestling, and then the WWN Super Shows. Um, so I guess my question is, will if they're going to have a tournament with people from all of these different promotions. Does that mean they're going to have women, they're going to go all Lucha, Lucha Underground and have the women fighting the men for the belt? Or I, I don't know. I, 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 I mean, I would love to say so, but I don't know. Uh, I mean, that's a big thing with women fighting men. I mean, there's a reason WWE star is way away from it. And that, I mean, the only person that really crosses that, no pun intended, is Nikki Cross right now. Right. So, but yeah. still, no man has ever hit a woman. Still. I mean, they've gotten away from it. I mean, it was the accidental spear that Stephanie took from Roman Reigns, but as even as it was done, it was looked as an as accident. I mean, right. it's not the Attitude Era or do for full on pedigreeing women and doing their whole move set on women. So I don't know. I don't know how that works, but I mean, it's interesting. It has made me interested in the uh, indie and it's actually going to make me look way more into this after uh, we get off of, after we stop this show. But uh, uh, I was just like, I saw when you saw it and I thought you were sending it to me because they have a set show in San Antonio the day before rumble. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be there. I might go. There you go. There you go. They're, they're going to have to. The, a lot of these indies that, that do shows around the big WWE events are going to have to. They just have to be really careful that they're not going head to head against NXT. As Ring of Honor ran into that with the first uh, show in Brooklyn that NXT did. They had for months had a show booked at a uh, baseball field there in uh, in New York. And uh, ended up going head to head with uh, with NXT, and that was that was. Uh, I mean, it's one thing to have a uh, an indie show against, say, I don't know, SummerSlam or some other WWE pay per view, because your hardcore indie fans are going to choose a good indie show 
over a big WWE show, and you'll be able to pull in enough people that would make that work, especially if the WWE pay-per-view sells out. But when you have NXT versus Evolve or NXT versus Ring of Honor, that's, you're going after the exact same fan base. And at that point, it really makes people go, okay, crap, which one do I want to go see? And it, it's a it's a harder harder thing to decide on. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you'll get to go. It would be cool to get some uh, some some uh, you know commentary and, and feedback from you from from one of those shows. And that's, this is something that I don't. I've watched clips of uh, specifically Evolve here and there, but they're another one I would love to to see more of. Uh, so and if unfortunately flows twenty bucks a month is a little much for me to go to, to, you know, invest in flow slam. Um, yeah, that won't happen. Yeah, exactly. And plus, I mean, really as much as there's this part of me, it's like, I'd really like to watch more such and such when it comes down to it, how much more time, as much as I love pro wrestling, do I want to spend watching pro wrestling? <laughs> Cause I got other stuff I want to do, man. Um, which Yoko girls was amazing this weekend. <laughs> you know, I've never watched that show. I, I, I need to check it out though. From everything I've heard, it's uh, I didn't realize though that Jared Padalecki had been in that show. Yeah, and you know what? It's funny because his name on the show was Dean. Oh, that's fantastic! <laughs> and then, of course, he has went on Supernatural fame with his br- brother or TV show brother Dean. So it's kind of kind of kind of funny that Dean's been a part of his life for a lot of years. That is. And I I think I think he's a really good actor. It's he's I probably at this point he is so typecast into his CW life cuz he's on the 11th season of of Supernatural and I mean he's making good money so why not keep you know say, keep milking that for all it's worth? Once you hit that syndication, man, that's that magic money. Yeah. But you, I could see him. He's because he he's a darn good looking dude. He's a good actor. I could see him doing other things. And same with Jensen Eccles. It's like you look at these two guys. You're like, wow these these are two actually really talented guys, and they've and they're doing great work on this show. But you could also see them doing other things. But on the flip side, it's like why? Because they're doing awesome stuff here on Supernatural. Yeah, and then now and then they have the Supernatural convention they do every year they make money that way uh they're fine oh yeah and yeah and that's a lot of these actors and actresses on once they get on on culty shows they start doing the the um con the comic-con loops and they go to the conventions oh you know they make a lot of money from that stuff yeah and they're they're really interesting because they don't really do that they just do their own comic-con they do it every year. It's in March. It's generally in Vegas, and it's just a bunch of. And they get a bunch of supernatural fans. My friend is a diehard supernatural fan, so she tries to go every year. Very cool. Very cool. Well, we've got one other thing we're going to talk about before we get into our top five for this week, and that is this coming Friday, Friday, December second, which happens to be my birthday. Uh, Ring of Honor has their biggest show of the year, their WrestleMania. It is Final Battle taking place in New York City in the famous Hammerstein Ballroom. Uh, great environment for, for a wrestling show. And I figured we'd go through the uh, go through the, the the card and give our thoughts on what's going on. Now, I know you have not been keeping up with Ring of Honor as much, and I haven't been very good about it either. Um if if you for those of you who, if you haven't been following Ring of Honor, you can go to their Facebook page right now, and they've got a lot of the promo package videos for this event, and you can really get caught up with what's going on from there. Um, but here here's the card. So the show's going to open with Colt Cabana taking on Dalton Castle. The former tag team partners have become enemies after Colt Cabana decided to knee Dalton in the crotch. Uh, this should be a fun match. Yeah, um, Colt Cabana, uh, one of the wasted WWE talents because this dude has more charisma in his pinky than a lot of people on the roster currently have in their whole bodies. Uh, And he can sell, and he's a good wrestler. And even it, I like, I did watch one of the videos with him and Dalton Castle, and it was like, I was completely. I was like into their feud. I didn't know what was going on at the next show because I, I wasn't really watching for context, but it was 
Uh, there's two guys I love. I love Dalton Castle. I think he's crazy entertaining. And then Colton Cabana, Colt Cabana is crazy entertaining. So I think it's going to be a great match. I'm looking right. forward to it. Yeah, and that the, the entrance, Castle's entrance, you know, is going to be epic. Peacock. Yes, he is. He is one of, if not the best entrance in Ring of Honor. Uh, uh, next up, we have Jushin Thunder, Thunder Liger taking on Silas Young. Uh, so yeah, Silas is the angry white man, and uh, he's taking on the legend of Jushin Liger. Uh, now, I didn't know this, but I was watching one of the video packages. Uh, Silas has recently had he had a title shot against Adam Cole and came really close to winning. So they've got him. He's really on just about on that cusp of breaking into the main event scene, and he's just not quite there yet. Uh, but this should, this should be a really good match. Juice Thunder Liger is like a hundred something years old. Um, yeah, I don't know how interested I would be in that match, even if it was heaven, because I remember Juice and Thunder Liger was my introduction into cruiserweight wrestling in 1989. Yep, <laughs> he is still going. That's the beauty of hiding behind that mask. It, yeah, so yeah, so that's 27 years ago. Let's say he was 18, which I seriously doubt that that's his age. I mean, it's like he's he's in his 40s or 50s right now. I saw him at that NXT show when they had him debut against they were having him wrestle against Tyler Breeze, and he had looked slower then. So I don't know. I, I guess I, if you're using it as a vehicle to put Young over, I get it. But I don't think Juice and Thunder Liger's a draw anymore. He, he, I, he probably isn't either. He's one of those guys that is he's an enhancement draw, meaning that if if people don't go specifically to see him, but if they see him on there, it, they, it, they might go, oh, that's the little added you know nudge they might need to go to a show kind of thing or give them added interest in going. But yeah, this absolutely young needs to win this match. Um, very much so, so he can keep moving up. Um, next up, we have Cody Rhodes taking on Jay Lethal. I know nothing about the build-up to this, I, uh, other than it sounds like it, it should be good. I mean, it's Cody Rhodes against Jay Lethal. He was, uh, Cody Rhodes made his own gimmick by, he has this checklist of indie wrestlers he wanted to wrestle. And he was going to make sure he wrestled everybody on this checklist. Guess who was at the top of the checklist? Jay Lethal. Jay Lethal. Okay. So. I remember when he posted that list on Twitter, and it was a who's who. Of the indie wrestlers. Yep, and it had Bola on there, Battle for Los Angeles. It was a, uh, yeah, that was a, uh, you know, I, I like the fact that Cody Rhodes has really done this whole thing. He just wants to, I, from what I can tell, he's going out there and just wants to prove to people that, hey, I'm actually a pretty good wrestler. And I I know that I spent my entire career in WWE, so I'm going to go out here on the indies, and I'm going to prove it to the most diehard wrestling fans that I actually can do this. And I'm a draw, and the fact that his wife is wrestling now, and she's kind of like his personal ring announcer, which is kind of cool. Uh, I get it. I'm like I, I, Cody is one of my favorites, so I wish him the best in it. And, and as long as he is into it and realizes this is not going to be a six-month, eighth-month thing. I mean, AJ went away for two years, and then the WWE brought him back. So it's just like, as long as he understands that he really needs to get involved in this and make it, he'll be fine. I think he is. I think he I think he knows it's going to take a while. Now, about the only thing he needs to do now is show up on, a, on in New Japan. But And he was... Who else can say that in a span of 12 months they have appeared on WWE, TNA, and Ring of Honor television? Damn, I mean, that's him. Him, maybe, yeah, let's say AJ Styles. Yeah, well, no, AJ wasn't on TNA TV, but he was, uh, he was on uh, New Japan and Ring of Honor in yeah. WWE. That uh, is true. But yeah, that's uh, so... So yeah, that, that should be interesting. We then have the cabinet: Caprice Coleman, Kenny King, and Rhett Titus taking on Chris Sabin, Alex Shelley, and Donovan Dijak. Um, boy, that shirt sure sounds 
interesting. Um, I guess Dijak has become a, a face, I think, um, at some or is he still with uh, Prince Nana? I'm I'm I can't I'm keep say, it. I'm going to say you, you know you're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> I know Saban and Shelley had a, a the, um, like a sit down interview where they were talking about wanting to build a new faction essentially of people that have that believe in the Ring of Honor core values and that they were saying that people like the addiction people like the Bullet Club that take um, cheap ways to 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 cheap. Um, shortcuts are are really stagnating uh, wrestling. It was a really good little segment. It's also on their uh, Facebook page. Um, and then you had uh, recently I saw on an episode um, the cabinet they are pissed is they, they they walked out to the to ringside on an episode of Ring of Honor TV and got on the mic and said, you know, we are three of the best wrestlers in the world and the best you can come up with for us Ring of Honor is the cabinet. Uh, make wrestling great again. This is this is all you've got for us. Okay, we'll watch out. And it was really cool. And so I don't know if they're wanting to just start running through people, uh, but it was interesting. Um, I have no idea how. The, I I think this will be a good match. I think everyone in here is is pretty good. Dijak's the greenest of them, but he's he's really talented. Uh, yeah, he's got WWE written all over him. Oh yeah, yeah, because he's Sasquatch. <laughs> and he's only Sasquatch because he's on <laughs> in the Ring of Honor, where the tallest guy is like six foot tall. <laughs> so true. that is true. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so I, he's like, I think he's like six. I, when I met him, he was like six five, six seven. He was a legitimate sized guy, but like then you'd see moves, and then you'd see the other guys, and he's like he's not that big compared to other wrestlers, but compared to everybody in Ring of Honor, he looks like he's Kevin Nash. <laughs> he does, uh, but yeah, it. You know, I. I wouldn't be surprised if the cabinet won this, especially if they're trying to build them up as kind of monstrous heels, and then, um, and if if Saban and Shelley lose by getting screwed over somehow, uh, that will build to them being able to put together a team, um, and because two of the guys that they mentioned uh, that they wanted to recruit are in the next match, and that's. Leo Rush and Jay White, who are teaming with Kushida to take on the Kingdom, which is now made up of TK Orion, Vinny Margus, um, I can't pronounce that, and Matt Taven uh, in the finals of the Ring of Honor Six Man Tag Team Championship Tournament. I just ask, why? Why does Ring of Honor need a Six Man Tag Championship? Their, their roster is thin right now to begin with. So why are we adding another belt? I I only know who one of those people are, Matt Taven. Then I don't do yeah. that. So my prediction on this match is the team that Matt Taven's on because that's the only person I've heard. There you go. Well, Kushida. But I, I think a six man. Uh, so I think six man title is like the most useless thing ever, unless you're like in WWE, you just want to put it on the new day. But I prefer the Freebird rule to the six man title. Agreed. Yeah. Or it's one thing if, like, in Lucha Underground, their tag team title is a six-man tag team title. And if that's going to be your tag team division, then fine. That's one thing. But to have two sets of tag titles is silly. And it's one thing, I know New Japan has their never open weight tag six-man tag team championship. But there's, like, 10 million people that work for New Japan. So when you have a roster that's huge, you can have a ton of belts. Just yeah, because like, you can use that to get some of the people that aren't normally on TV over. Exactly. Just like back in the day when the NWA had, you know, you had your your U.S. you had your your tag team championships, your world tag team championships, and you had your U.S. tag team championships. Then you had your six man tag team championship, and then you had a U.S. six man tag team championship. And that's because the NWA was working with all these different promotions, and they were using it to get hundreds of people over. And eventually, most of those disappeared. Um, but yeah, I agree. I think uh, I think the kingdom is going to win this. Um, just so you know, Koshida is the guy who beat um, Kenny Omega for the uh, IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship uh, about a year ago. Um, it was no, it was earlier this year, right before Kenny turned on AJ Styles. Uh, so okay. Koshida, he's he's a guy. He dresses like he's. Um, uh, Marty McFly, uh, from, okay. uh, and he's really, really good. 
Uh, Leah Rush is this really, really tiny little super muscular black dude who flips around a lot. He's really good. And Jay White is your kind of average looking white wrestler guy who's smaller. He's, he looks like a Ring of Honor New Japan guy. Um, I, I have no idea who these other two people with Matt Taven are in the kingdom. Um, and so, yeah. I, I, I just think this this whole thing is silly. Um, the next matchup is the Young Bucks defending the Ring of Honor Tag Team Championship against the Briscoes. I think if the Briscoes win, I think it would be their 10th tag run or 10th time with the belts. Um, what do you think? Uh, I'm gonna go with young. I'm gonna go with the young bucks. I think they're really, really trying to stick with their uh, bullet club thing right now. So of course, some run ins, and the young bucks go ahead and keep the belts. I can see that, and you can milk young bucks and Briscoes for a while because you know the four of them are gonna work really well together. Uh, then we've got the uh, semi main event for the Ring of Honor TV Championship. It is a fatal four way match. The new champion, Marty Skrull, will take on former champions Will Offspray and Bobby Fish, along with Dragon Lee, who's another New Japan guy. Um, this should be fantastic. Will Ospreay lost it on his next match to the Marty Skrull guy? He did. Oh, okay. The whole, the whole, it was all part of their, their tour of England. And oh. they were you know two huge international signings that are two of the most over guys in England. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, and people apparently were losing their mind that this, how could they cheapen the title by moving it so quickly? And, but it was, uh, I was listening to the voices of wrestling podcast earlier today and they were talking about this and, um, they brought up some really good points in the fact that here ring of honor was able to sign two of the hottest free agents in independent wrestling, um, both of which were at least Marty Skrull was offered a contract with Evolve, so they they took they got them away from Evolve, um, and and they were in their home countries. So why not do something to really put both of these guys over in their hometowns? Um, and then you look at the history of the TV title, and rapid title changes are not something that is common. Well, in in Ring of Honor, period. Uh, but most of the, the former champions have held them for a long period of time, three months or more. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it should be a great match. Um, I have no idea who's going to win, though. <laughs> I'm going to go with Osprey. There you go. All right. I like that guy. Yeah, I do, too. And then we've got the main event, uh, Adam Cole defending the Ring of Honor World Championship against Kyle O'Reilly in a fight without honor. Uh, these guys are like, they're like, they're kind of, they define each other in a ways that like Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens do. And it, at some point it always comes back to these two fighting. Uh, See, but, I don't know anything about the history of it. I mean, I like Kyle O'Reilly, but he's a little wiry for my taste. Uh, Adam Cole, um, yeah, he one of the best wrestlers in the world. So, I mean, I'm not saying anything about O'Reilly. I just don't like his body makeup. But other than that, I I think they were going to put on a classic match, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be hearing about it all next week. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing it. They are uh, they were a tag team when they first came out. Uh, they were um, I can't remember the name of it, but they were uh, they were a team together, and uh, then they split up, had a huge, huge battle, and that was, they had a fight without honor. And it was kind of the one that put the two of them both on the map as singles wrestlers. And then they went their separate ways. And now they're in the last year. They, for a while, uh, made back up and they were teaming again. Um, when Adam Cole was, was kind of went face for a while. And then he turned on Kyle O'Reilly when Kyle was, was challenging for the ring of honor championship against, um, Jay lethal. And it's, it's just been kind of downhill since then, meaning their relationship, at least in kayfabe. So, uh, so yeah, that that is final battle. It should be a really good show. I'm hoping to watch it before next week, and, uh, and so we can talk about it next week. Um, and uh, that is all the news. Did you have any other news or anything you wanted to talk about before we go into uh, our top five for the week? 
big congratulations to Randy Orton on introducing the new baby into this world with his current wife. Um, that's about it. Other than I don't think there's any more wrestling news. Yeah, I don't think there is either. Yeah, good call. Yeah, congratulations to to Randy Orton and his wife. That's awesome. Uh, so this brings us to our top five list for this week, and this is top five debuts of 2016. And you did give a caveat to this that unless something happened during the um, the draft episode of SmackDown, that in and of itself doesn't count. So right. the, the video of Nia Jax standing up and going, holy crap, from the Performance Center does not count as her debut. On no. Her. Yeah. <laughs> Though that was a cool moment. That was... And and I was like, why did they not show the, that stuff during the show? But I digress. Did you have any honorable mentions? Yes, I have two. Uh, first, Baron Corbin. Uh, his actual debut was WrestleMania, and he won the Andre the Giant tournament. You can't really have a bigger debut than that. Uh, as, far, as far as the actual in-ring performance, his he there was no pop, there was no fanfare. He was just one of the 20 guys, so that's why... It, didn't make my actual list, but he did win the battle royal, and it has catapulted his career since then. And the X one, I didn't put; I only put his honor mention because I don't think it really applies. Because Eric Young actually debuted; he did a one match in NXT earlier this year. But I'm doing the debut of Sanity as a group. Ooh. I thought was so over because how they came out in mask, and you didn't even know the little one was a girl. I mean, that was like a shock when it was, and, and I didn't, I mean, I kind of heard online that it was probably Eric Young, but really you wouldn't have known it was Eric Young. They came completely covered, and they took two uh, characters, Sawyer Falter and then Alexander Wolf, who had been kind of flailing in the NXT division, and it has given them a focus, and so I really appreciated that debut. Good call. I I didn't even think about that one. Yeah, they were uh, they were jobbers. I yeah. mean, straight up jobbers, and that was a cool debut. So, uh, man, I didn't I didn't even think about that one. So, I've got three honorable mentions. Um, what I really wanted to include on my list was Bobby Roode at Takeover Brooklyn, and that's until I realized that no, he was actually on an episode of NXT before that. Um, so I kind of have that one sort of half heartedly. Did he wrestle? No, but he walked out. He his music played. He okay. walked out. He challenged. Okay. Okay. Oh no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's what I was uh, thinking about. Okay. Uh, so another one that is also kind of questionable was Sami Zayn's actual Raw debut on March seventh uh, because he was in the Royal Rumble. He was on Raw when he challenged um, uh, John Cena the, in the previous year. But this was kind of, you can kind of chalk both of those up to possible one-time appearances. But this was his first I'm on Raw and I'm here to stay moment. Uh, and the crowd, in all three of those cases, the crowd went ape shit. Um, but this is, I included that one. And then one that is, you can't argue that is an actual debut, was Apollo Crews on the Raw after WrestleMania. Um, coming out, he actually got a good reaction, and it is just a crime what has happened to this poor man since then. So those are my honorable mentions. All right. All right, let's number five. Who do you got? Number five, I got Bobby Roode, and I'm talking about the actual NXT debut. The reason it made number five, because it introduced the song Glorious Domination, and that I I never heard so many people talking about a wrestling related song and uh that quickly that next week that song had blew up and everybody had downloaded it and I was hearing it everywhere and so that is why and the fact that he comes out to this amazing pop and I'm thinking this music is so hill and in 3 minutes he went from face to overwhelmingly hated that was a great that was a great great debut that was that was and that's why it was on my honorable mentions that was it was so good and <laughs> this is actually something talking about i mentioned the voices wrestling podcast earlier something they've harped on a few times as uh one of the hosts um 
I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but he makes an argument that Bobby Roode is the luckiest wrestler alive because he's only as over as he is because of that song. Um, now, what do you think? I mean, I think he's over. I think it has helped. I don't think it's the only reason he's as over as he is. Uh, I mean, it's in Orlando, so he was going to be over no matter what. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, based on, I don't know if he, he would have been as over as far as the main roster, especially at Brooklyn, but uh, he's because the song was over. But big, the big thing is, uh, with as far as that, is that NXT is shot in Orlando, and he's already over in Orlando. Yes, very true. And he did such a great job in that promo. Uh, of of taking an audience that was just oh my god you're awesome and making them hate him uh, that was that was I thought really really good because he is very good as a heel uh, my number five is the Raw after WrestleMania again uh, and it is the debut of Colin Cassidy and Enzo Amore huge pops this was just so much fun I loved it. Good entrance. There was a good one. Yeah, number four, who you got? I got the only one that's non-WWE NXT. Uh, he debuted in TNA, and I was I had just recently become a fan of him. And, and one hand gesture pretty much tells you who I'm talking about. Moose. Oh, he, yes. Uh, he debuted in TNA, and this dude's an athletic freak. I have been just since I really discovered him early this year. I have been the, like a huge fan of his. I, I even if I don't watch TNA, I try to find the clips of his matches because what he can do in the ring at his size is crazy. But this debut was because the music hits, and you know it's the same music he used in TNA. So I knew he was signing exclusively with. Uh, uh, the same music he was losing to ROH, so I knew it signed exclusively with TNA, so I thought they would have to change the music. But apparently he owns his music. So he had it done and everything. This is from what I understand. So when the music comes out and it goes, he does the hand gesture and the crowd gets into it, I mean, I don't hear a lot of big pops in TNA when I watch TNA, but that was the biggest pop I've heard all year. You don't hear much when you watch TNA. That poor... Yeah. It's just sad, but and I actually I, I was meaning to watch that episode to see his debut, and I missed it. Like because I watched um, Mike Bennett's debut, and I thought that was pretty cool. Didn't make my list, but yeah, Moose is great. Uh, his music is fantastic. It if he ever would get signed to WWE, I hope they let him use that music since he owns it, and they could just you know work a deal. That because I mean they've already they've shown that they'll work deals with guys who have existing copyrights. Look, yeah. they've just straight up took AJ Styles' pre-existing merch and ma- basically made it themselves. Because I mean those uh, gloves he's been selling for years. What are the producer guys' name again that produced the music for WWE? Uh, CFOs. They can. I'm just gonna say they can probably take the song. The song is pretty decent. But I'm pretty sure they can do their CO of O magic on it and probably make it ten times better. True. Yes. It, it's you keep the basically let the CFOs re, do a, a remix. Yeah. Yeah. Let him do his thing, and I think they'll make it better. Very good. All right. So my number four is the Raw after SummerSlam, and it was the uh, the introduction of Bailey. Um, she had made an appearance, I think, once before. No, it was at the at that. Um, she was Sasha's secret partner. Yes, uh, but that was they kept talking about this is a one off thing, and so this was her actual debut on Raw, and I thought it was great. It was it was handled very very well. The crowd went nuts for her because you know Brooklyn loves them some Bailey, uh, so yeah, that was that was my hey, number four. Hey, we want some Bailey. Oh, yeah. yeah, that oh man, who would? God, what what's where was it that that just they they completely took over everything recently? Uh, that was uh, Scotland. Yes. Oh, that was so much fun. Uh, so, up to number three. Who is your number three? My number three is the realest guys in the room. The day after Raw, Enzo and Big Cass. The reason being for me is I was in the building, and Shane got a great pop that night. Cesaro got a great pop that night. 
but the literal chair was shaking that I was in when that music hits. And it's actually that music is my wake up music in the morning, and it get because it gets me so <laughs> pumped up. But it was like when you hear, I mean, the place is sold out, and you hear them going through. My name is Enzo Amore, and everybody is saying it. I'm looking at little kids that are pretty much just repeating what they hear, and it was it it, it shook the room. And I will still say, it wasn't my number one. But as far as a wrestling experience, other than people saying doing the yes thing at WrestleMania 30, that was about as out of control as I've seen a crowd. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that that I'd forgotten how you right that was so loud. And it was so loud. I'm like in the room, and I'm like I'm saying it, and I can't hear myself saying it. <laughs> that's amazing. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. And I think that really opened up because there was a there was a good chance you, that that Vince could have put the kibosh on these guys pretty quickly, um, but that was so that was such the the perfect place to to debut Cass and Enzo that that Raw after Mania crowd, and uh, and yeah that was just so that was great. Um, so my number three is from NXT Takeover Dallas. It's the debut of Shinsuke Nakamura. I can say that was uh, like not being the biggest Nakamura fan. I, I like I said, I'm trying to take this and I'm trying to look at it through just what it meant to the company the next few months. And there was yeah, it was a big big debut. Uh, I had a, actually had a ticket to that show, and um, well, we only could find one ticket ever. I bought my ticket. It was at the top, and my friend Rusty was with me. Now, Rusty is a huge wrestling fan like we are, but Rusty loves NXT, and Shinsuke Nakamura is his favorite. So, being the guy that I am, I don't know, it was just a whim. I gave him his ticket and went and watched it at home. Oh, what a good guy. Well, no, it was a, I was going to say it wasn't for that. It was just like, WrestleMania is WrestleMania to me. I would never, if I'm in a build room for WrestleMania, I would never skip for WrestleMania. I would never give my ticket away for WrestleMania because since I was a kid, that was it. That was his big show, and he couldn't get a ticket. And, and what I mean by t- couldn't get a ticket, he couldn't get one for a reasonable price. They were like 300 bucks just to be in the room. Oh yeah, yeah, that's 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 ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. that was. I I think this this debut also, they were shocked. I think the company. Because they had a feeling, that, and I think Sami Zayn has talked about this. They had a feeling; they knew he was going to be over. They didn't know how over this man was going to be. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So who is your number two? It's the same. Unfortunately, our 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 things line up quite often. Is Shinsuke Nakamura? Uh, I I honestly am going from the secondhand reaction for the people in the room. Uh, I had three friends that were there, uh, three friends that are in the club, and then I had like several other friends that I've made, and they just talked about how just how everybody was into it, and the music was perfect, and shaking on the inside moment, and then that match, that match with Sami Zayn. I mean, I'm not a biggest fan of Strong Style, but a lot of people have rated that as a five-star match. And to have that in your debut and to be Sami Zayn's last match on the roster, uh, on the NXT roster, I have to tip my hat. I have to give credit where credit's due, Shinsuke Nakamura. Yeah, well, you know he's got two Match of the Year contenders, His this match and then the match he had a few months earlier at, at Wrestle Kingdom against AJ Styles it was also okay. a match of the year contender. So, yeah, that uh, that was such a great, such a great moment. Uh, my number two uh, was Finn Balor's Raw debut, the Raw after Backlash, which was the Raw after the, um, yeah, all that stuff. When he first came out, and they were like, okay. This is we've got. We're making this new belt, and then they introduce Finn last, and he walks out, and uh, and then they he's got that match against Roman Reigns, and he wins. And at that point, you you look at this, you're like, oh my god, they are actually going to push this guy as a legit main eventer. I'm shocked. 
Uh, it wasn't on my list because I forgot. Uh, <laughs> so let me just say that I forgot that that happened. Um, but yeah, you beat the person they've been building up for the last two years in your first match on Raw. I don't see how you can get. I mean, I don't see how you can get more over than that. And of course, Finn Balor is. I mean, he is universally beloved by fans and other wrestlers alike. So, yeah, that was a great entrance. All right, so it's time for number one. And I I think we know. I think it's the same. Probably. I think it was the most phenomenal entrance in the WWE, don't you think? It was truly phenomenal. Uh, Yeah, so pretty much, I don't know if we can do it at the same time. So our number one is who? One, two, three. AJ AJ Styles. Styles. Yep, the Royal Rumble. Whoa. No more better place for him to debut than Orlando. Nope. Yeah, because he, A, he'd wrestled there for many years. B, it's becoming a smarky city thanks to NXT. Yeah. So, it, yeah, and I think that opened up a lot of eyes. I, I think that that and then his performance with against um, uh, Reigns right. in those couple yeah. of matches and those few pay-per-views really gave, made, opened Vince's eyes. But yeah, that was incredible. And then, and... It was, I was on the I hate Roman Reigns bandwagon. I was kind of getting on that bandwagon. I was kind of starting to be the conductor of that train. And then that match with AJ happened, and I realized how good Roman Reigns is. Yeah. And a lot of what I started hating about him wasn't his in-ring work. It was just how he was being booked. And AJ Styles pretty much changed my mind on him. He um, He actually... He actually made me, he has, it's worked both ways because I've loved him with the Roman Reigns, but I don't think Dean Ambrose steps out of his um, comfort zone and really pushes AJ and has taken advantage of working with AJ. I think he just does his same thing and it's annoying. Yeah, yeah, You the, the feud with AJ and, and, and Dean Ambrose should be having better matches than they are. Yes, and that's that's what I'm saying. It's like that's how good AJ is. I'm like Dean's not taking advantage of it. No, no. But the, this the entrance, the the only thing that screwed this up was the way that they filmed it, and they're focusing on 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 Roman's face the whole time. And they since have have released a a different cut version on their YouTube channel. Um, which I think they put out the day day or so later that showed the crowd reacting and showed that when it said I am and then phenomenal appearing on the screen because the whole time we're watching on TV and it's just this tight close up on Roman Reigns face with this look of like, who's this guy? And you hear this music, people like what? And then you hear the crowd going berserk and, and Michael Cole, is it, is it screaming? And, um, yeah, he actually sold that pretty well. Yeah, you, I, that the whole thing was 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 perfect. I mean, it was he came out in the slow walk he did, and in a in a way he was still he was almost for the insider fans. He the way he was walking slow, like he was still in some pain, was from the beating he took from the Bullet Club just you know weeks before. He was still recovering from that in a way. Um, but I love the slow walk. I love the way he got in the ring and just kind of looked around. And, uh, and yeah, the way they sold that with, uh, I forget, I think it was Byron Saxon made a comment about uh, for that it just got real for Roman Reigns or something like that. Um, yeah, it was, um, it was one of those moments that I'll never forget because it was like it was a moment I never thought I would see. And I, and there, as much as I've liked wrestling, everything and use like anything can happen, anything is possible. It's literally something I thought I'd never see. Back when I start, started watching TNA and three years in, AJ Styles, favorite wrestler, clearly the best wrestler in the world. And I just long, I, I actually longed for the day that WWE never signed him. Because I was like, they wouldn't know what to do with this kid. I'm like, he's just too good, and he's not, and he's not big enough. And understand, me, I am definitely a person that will say, hey, you're not big enough. But this, this kid just like when you watch him wrestle, like he's a grown man now. When you watch him wrestle, you forget how big he is because 
he takes every bump, he makes everything so much better, and you forget it, and that moment, you heard the crowd was into it, everybody was perfect city, of course, and and he comes out in this hard, this hip hop music because I don't know what he really played in the Indies. I remember his TNA music, but he comes out this hip hop music, and I'm like, who is this guy? And it's honestly my favorite theme music. And I did it. Then it said, "I am." I was like, I have no idea. Then phenomenal pops up, and I was like, biggest shock because I did not know he was debuting at the Rumble. Yeah, and I love that they use the same font. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, now one thing I think they hadn't quite cleared the copyrights for his P1 symbol because he didn't start doing the thing where he holds his hands together with the gloves for a few weeks. And I th- yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they're like, hey, don't do that yet since we don't quite have the copyright thing for that. Because my understanding is when he signed, he basically worked out a deal that they get to use all of his copyrights and they they both share in the wealth because that that night it they saw all the aj styles t-shirts they had sold out of that building they it completely sold out um it was yeah that's yeah and it was like four days later i was gonna uh, order mine because i had to wait for payday and it was back ordered for like two months yep and then when i got to uh wrestlemania they were sold out <laughs> yeah it, it it's god he he is you know he is if not the best wrestler in the world, he is in top three to five. Uh, I would argue he's probably the best wrestler in the world. Uh, he his and that moment was so cool. I mean, it's you can honestly liken this. He it's like when Ric Flair showed up in the WWF. Yeah, something you never thought would happen. AJ Styles is this generation's Ric Flair just as much as as John Cena is Hulk Hogan, and. But- AJ Styles, the bet the thing about it is AJ Styles, since he's been there, has been booked perfectly. I'm like, if he had gotten lost in the shuffle like I thought, this entrance, I probably wouldn't have made my list. But the fact that it is built to him being the guy in the WWE right now, the the workhorse. Hey, you need a great match, put him with AJ. And that's what's gonna happen. He's made James Ellsworth. He's put him over. I mean, seriously, their matches together, no one would think that AJ Styles and James Aylesworth in a main event right. match would keep yeah. people so intrigued as it is. Because AJ should murder him, but he does such a great job oh, um, of selling. There's a turn in this case, the whole the, Dean the character actually works on the, with it. The, the thing on the left. So, I, I yeah, I, I can't say any more than I can say about that. Uh, yes. No, wait, it's on the left. Yeah, I agree, Floyd. Uh, it's uh, it just such a great moment. Um, so yeah, um, that that. Did you have anything else you wanted to add for this week? Uh, no. Uh, I, like uh, I can honestly say, sorry about that. Uh, AJ Styles really, really. I just wanted to say, as far as him this year and joining the the group and doing the show has reinvigorated my love for wrestling. You yeah, I'm thinking, you know, I'm such consistently a big fan uh that uh you forget how much it is and I get to hear other people's opinions. That's why I, I feel like it's so important that we hear from you because I mean, that's what makes this worth doing is that I want to hear other people's opinions. Agreed. And I tell you what, you have you've helped me continue to do the show because I was doing it for a while and I had another guest uh, co-host a uh, really good guy named Jason and due to scheduling in life he couldn't do it anymore and I took a break for like f- four months I think I did a, a Wrestlemania show um, Jason came on and then I didn't I didn't touch it for until August and then started doing it again a little bit and then it was uh, you coming back on the show is, has actually made this fun because just me talking about this by myself gets real freaking boring <laughs> um, so, so I, I appreciate Floyd you coming on the show, and uh, and that was a great. I, I, this was a good top five. Now we we need to figure out what are we going to talk about next week. Top five next week, and so we're in December. So I think we should start looking at some of our yearly things for this year. Okay. So uh, I'm gonna say, let's do um, 
I don't know. What, I forgot what I said. I feel like we should do top top five moments. Okay. And it's just like that moment. I'm. I honestly think a couple, one of one of the people from this list is definitely going to still be on this next list. But um, just the top five moments that has really grabbed you this year, whether it be TNA, indie wrestling. I mean, all mine are going to be from WWE or NXT, just because that's the majority of what I watch. But it, it, it's like let's do the top five moments from 2016. Okay, sounds good. And, and we'll do our. Uh, I'll be in Dallas for the show, so we'll be doing our uh, preview of, or yeah, preview of TLC. Sounds good. Well, uh, until then, we will uh, make sure to check out our YouTube channel again, youtube.com forward slash around the ring OK. Send us some email at around the ring OK at gmail.com. Uh, also, you can uh, find us on Twitter and Facebook at around the ring okay send us some tweets and you can also find on the facebook page or on on facebook on the twitter page you can find links to our own personal twitters if you just want to send us some messages that way that would be cool too so until next week uh we will see you guys later have a good one you have a good one you've been listening to around the ring on the spark radio network all you have to do is change your point of view Austin 316 says I just whipped your ass. Bam! Woo! That sucks more than anything that I've ever fucked before. What? It's for charity. <laughs>